Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Um, do we have any preliminary matters to discuss before uh, we open up? Uh, just to welcome Dr. Hammer back to the commission. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Glad to be back. Looking forward to it. Welcome, indeed. Um, I would also like to uh, thank our past uh, uh, chair people, uh, especially Stephanie Chibalco. Uh I sincerely want to wish her well in adding to her family and uh, hope to hear from her sometime. That's an invitation, Stephanie. Um, i also like to thank Mr. Berger for uh, setting the example of uh, chairman. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, for their input here, and uh, especially uh, Phil and um, uh, Robin, for all the work they do behind the scenes. It's, uh, it goes uh, unnoticed uh, more than it should. So with that, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. You are attending the April 4th, 2022 session of the Animal Matters Commission. The Animal Matters Commission was established and is conducted in accordance with Article 12 of the Anne Arundel County Code. These are administrative hearings, and by their nature, they are informal, which means you are not hampered by rules of evidence. However, please be aware that you are still testifying under oath. Each party will have their full opportunity to state their respective cases, after each party has an opportunity to state their case, they will also have an opportunity to ask questions of the other party. Please do not interrupt the other party. You will be given ample time to talk and state your positions. In many cases, we are aware that there is a history. However, please remain focused on the issues at hand. After each case, the commission will have an open deliberation during these deliberations, the public may not participate. If the commissioners have an additional question during deliberations, you may answer that question. However, no further information will be heard and a decision shall be rendered. The decision is a recommendation to the chief of police or his or her representative. The recommendation of the commission will be taken into consideration and a final decision shall be made by the chief of police or his or her representative. If as a defendant in the case, you are unhappy with the decision in the matter, you may appeal. For citation cases, the appeals are made to the District Court of Maryland. For administrative orders, cases such as potentially dangerous, dangerous and vicious orders, the appeals are made through the County Court of Appeals. Mr. Hall, please call our first case. Absolutely. Our first case, we have Jamie Smilowitz versus Stanley Bice for two citations, one animal disturbance prohibited, one animal public nuisance for Sleepy the dog. All parties who have an interest in this case who wish to testify may now come forward to take the oath. Please utilize Zoom's raise hand feature. I'll get you added in one at a time and sworn in all together at the end. I would also ask everybody that's not speaking to uh, mute themselves, please. Mr. Bice, I see you there. If you would please unmute your audio. Can you hear me, sir? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. If you would please state your full name and address for the record. Right. Stanley Bice. 251 Admiral Cochran Drive, apartment 3013, Annapolis, Maryland, 21401. Thank you, sir. Hang out for just a second. I'll get you sworn in at the end here. Ms. Smilowitz, if you would please unmute your audio. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. Perfect. And I can hear you. If you would please state your name and full address for the record. 
Jamie Smilowitz, 268 Overleaf Drive, Arnold, Maryland, 21012. Thank you kindly. If you would just hang out for a moment, I'll get you sworn in as well. And then I believe that's, is that Miss Pice, Jen? Yes. My name is Jennica Bice, and I am 247 Overleaf Drive, Arnold, Maryland, 21012. And will you be uh, testifying today as a witness for the defendant? Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm oh. here as support, and, and Sleepy's my dog. I got you, 10 4. I'll just put you down as a witness for now. And then if I could get everyone to raise their right hand. Uh, and Mr. Vice, if you would unmute for this. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Nope, no worries. Do you declare and affirm under the penalties of perjury the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. If I could get an affirmative from you, Ms. Smilowitz. Yes, I do. Yes. Thank you kindly. So if everyone would please remain muted unless called upon to speak and we are good to proceed. Okay, uh, let us start with uh, hearing from the complainant, um, which I believe um, is Ms. Smilowitz. Um, you can uh, state your case and any witness testimony you may have. Um, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, so just for um, reference, and I didn't uh, send this in and I apologize. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. I just have pictures of a map so you can sort of familiarize yourself with the neighborhood and the position of things. Um, and I don't know, no, you're not gonna be able to see it. Okay, that's not gonna work. And I apologize. I was trying to give you, no. Can you make that out at all or no? It seems yeah, to be if, disappearing. If you are altering the background <clears throat> um, of your video feed. It's kind of, it blocks that out as well. Okay, I don't know how to un, on uh change the background to be normal so um does anybody know how to do that and i apologize is anybody can anybody guide me on to how to change the background so i can show this or no um, you mean, where, so where, down, oh, down in the bottom uh, middle of the screen there should be a bar running along the bottom of your window, which has options to mute, stop video, and view various different settings. Do you see that when you hover your mouse down there? Yes, I do. Is there a three dot section with more? Um, bottom right, maybe? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I don't see anything with three dots. Um, so at the bottom bar, what options do you have? Um, mute, share video, or stop video. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I see something that says blur my background. So if I take that away, it's still going to so, blur my background. Yeah, that's, that's just a, a different effect, but um, keep, keep going on that list of options down there. Okay. There we go. And I apologize for this. Um, there should be none. I guess None, visual back. That sounds right. Yep. No visual effects. It's not letting me do it. Okay. Um, there, uh, excuse me. There are some photographs in the file. I don't know uh, if you sent them in. I believe Mr. Bice sent yeah, those. I, uh, if, if they can help you at all, you can feel free to use those as well. Uh, they are photographs. Of, of the uh, neighborhood for what it's worth. Oh, okay. One, one thing I could help with this. So where it says stop video, Jamie, there's an up arrow. It's real tiny to the right of stop video. If you click on it, go up to choose video back, uh, virtual background. And then under there you select none and then okay. So it's, I, I believe it's because it's still got a virtual background. So I believe, yeah. yeah oh. This is changing. Oh, there we, there we go. go. 
Okay. Here we go. Thank you. I just didn't take it. Okay. And I apologize. So can is that visually? Can you see that at all? Um, yes, um, we can see it. I'm not sure we understand what we're looking at. I could see Overleaf Drive on the map. Okay, so Overleaf Drive. Um, this is my house. This is the Vice's house. Oh, you're gonna have to hold it up. We're not seeing where you're pointing. No, move it up. Okay, I, no, not closer. Back up a little bit. Okay. Now sorry. raise it. Raise it up just yeah, a little bit. There okay. You there you go. Now right. we, can see, we can see two yellow. Okay. So this is mine and that's the vices. Um, okay. And for further, this is the neighborhood. Can you see that? That'll hold it up a little bit. There we go. Um, yeah, little it's not perfect. very clear. We can't make it out in detail. Yeah, it's very, it's a blurry map and I apologize for that. Um, but so this is Silverleaf Drive. This is Overleaf Drive, this circular, and the houses are are in red. Okay. If, if you could see that, just for, because I'm going to read what I wrote to the court, just in reference to what happened where. Okay. And uh, does that make sense at all? Okay. Thank you. Um, for reference, it's, I'm starting my narrative with seeing Mr. Bice right about here on Silverleaf Drive. There's a there's a glare on it. You're going to have to bring it in a little a little close. There we go. It's clear. So, okay, so this is Silverleaf Drive and um I I had seen him come in in his car around here. Um and I continued on my walk. So I I just for reference of what then transpired and how I was walking down that path. I'm not an extremely fast walker, um, but I do get momentum as I'm coming down the hill. Um, so from there to up the street and then made a right onto Overleaf. So I, that's just for reference. Um, I am just gonna read what I had written on Sunday, November 28th. 2021 at approximately 3 p.m. I was walking my dog Miley leashed on Silverleaf Drive in Arnold walk, walking towards Turnwing Drive on the left side of the street. I noticed a Ford SUV dr driven by Stan Bice make the turn. Stan made eye contact and watched me as he passed in his car. Miley and I continued on our walk. We proceeded to cross Silverleaf and return to Overleaf Drive, where I live. We made the right turn and proceeded down the street on the right side of the street, the same side as my home. In front of 270 um, Overleaf Drive, while speaking with my neighbor, Mike, um, I heard Stan Bice's dog, Sleepy, start howling, whining, and barking. I turned to look as I had only just seen him a few seconds before in his car. Stan was standing at the corner of Silverleaf Court with Sleepy, who was carrying on and lunging. Sleepy's barking and howling was very loud and prevented Mike and I from hearing each other speak. Stan did not seem to have control at that point over Sleepy's behavior and was unable to stop her from carrying on. Um, he continued to stand there and eventually made a right towards Silverleaf Drive onto Silverleaf onto Overleaf Drive on the opposite side of the street of where I was talking with Mike. I proceeded towards my home, which is the very next house on the street, um, 268. When I got to my driveway, I observed my neighbor, Mark, across the street, raking leaves in his front yard. He stopped raking and he and I started to exchange pleasantries from across the street. I stayed on my driveway and he on the sidewalk in front of his house at 2.53. Um, as we were talking, um, Mark, aware of the previous attack by Sleepy on myself and Miley said, motion to me, Sleepy's behind you. 
I turned to observe Stan Weiss and his dog Sleepy, who had crossed the street at some point and were now walking on the sidewalk in front of my home proceeding towards me while I was standing in my driveway. Um, when Sleepy noticed me and Miley, she started to howl and whine and bark and fully pull on her leash. I backed up my driveway um, as I had nowhere to go. Um, I am physically disabled. I got into a car accident in 2006. Um, I, have, I cannot run, I cannot get away. Um, and I have a lot of stairs to get up to my door what was in my driveway was my car. So I backed up towards my car and my stairs, um, sort of my only safe place at that point for me. Um, uh, Stan and Sleepy continued walking toward me, my, toward me and Miley getting closer. Sleepy was lunging and her hackles on the back of her neck were up. I was frozen in shock. I really was frozen there and didn't, just in shock and didn't know what to do because, you know, I knew I couldn't get up my stairs quick enough um, and open my door, which was locked. Um, Stan allowed Sleepy to come on my property on the grass directly in front of my house while I was standing there. He did not attempt to move into the street or cross to avoid the interaction. Um, I found Stan's behavior to be very intimidating and frightening. Um, um, I feel it it likened to stalking in light of the history of the attack by Sleepy with the Bice's children in October of 2020. Um, Stan did not seem to have control over the dog at all. Her front paws were off the ground as she was fully extended from Stan. Her, she, he actually stopped in front of my house and softly said to Sleepy, stop, quiet, Sleepy. Stop, quiet, stop, Sleepy. He could not control his dog's behavior. He did not raise his voice to his dog. Um, if anything, he antagonized the situation by stopping in front of my house and, and allowing Sleepy to continue to trespass. Um, I believe that Stan created a confrontational and dangerous situation for myself and my dog, Miley. It is clear to me um, that the training that Sleepy was supposed to have had after our last interaction with animal control has not changed Sleepy's behavior towards us. Um, um, uh, I have, since the hearing, and I believe it was before the hearing, um, actually the last hearing, that I had changed my behavior to not walking down that street, that I used to walk down our street, go to the dead end, come back up the street where I would pass the bices and continue walking. I do not go that way at all anymore. Um, suffice to say I was on, I went down there twice without my dog because I was in the role of um, uh, somebody on the HOA board here and needed to go to the common area. Um, um, Basically, that is, um, it was very alarming to me. It was very intimidating to me. It was very threatening to me um, in light of the situation that had occurred in October of 2020. Um, and that that's basically what I, that's the, the story of what happened. Okay. Um, I uh, are there any questions of the uh, commission? Does Ms. Smilowitz at this time? Uh, yes, I do. I excuse me. I'm I've sorry. I apologize, uh, um, Mr. Hall. I don't know if at this point you um, give the show the letter from the witness who witnessed the whole thing, and also the recording. 
um, of Sleepy. Um, and the recording is um, of a previous interaction um, with Sleepy as I was trying to get in my house. Um, so it's you're not going to see anything. It's there for the for you to hear the audio of how agitated that dog sounds. And um, I, I believe it, it it's re related to my dog. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm not a dog expert, so. Um. Okay, so we're still hearing testimony. Phil, do you have that? I can certainly present those for you. I will start with the letter. Let's see. Is that up? It's flashing. Uh oh, let me try again. If you can't get the letter up, I can read the letter. No, no worries. Let me try one more time. Okay. Is that better? There we go. When everybody is uh, finished reviewing this document, I guess we can uh, listen to the recording. I don't want to rush anybody. Everybody, uh, you know, read it fully. I believe it is in the case file. Sorry for any background noise. I've got a couple people walking through the facility. Let me see if I can get this shared here. Share system audio. Screen two. And Okay, um, Ms. Snowless, if you're satisfied with your uh, presentation of your case, are you ready to accept questions from the commission now? Um, <clears throat> I, I apologize for my hesitation. Um, I just want to say that um, during the previous um, I guess the answer would be no, and I apologize for not answering you. Um, during the previous um, hearing, um, Jen had stated we're trying very hard to give them space, uh, meaning them, meaning myself and Miley. Um, and I think that that is kind of crucial here because I was not given space in any shape or form, given that I was standing on my property. Um, so um, that's that's what I would like. That's the last thing I'd like to say. Um, and um, I am finished. I did, I'm not finished. <laughs> I did send the letter March 6th to the Bices um, about 
um, coming towards me with their dog. Um, so it, it's an ongoing situation. Okay. Um, I believe Dr. Hammer had uh, his hand raised. Uh, he has a question. Dr. Hammer? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, probably the big question I have, I can't seem to access it on the, uh, on the website, is what was the dis – did, that, did the Animal Matters Commission actually have a hearing on this in June of 2020? And if they did, what was the uh, what were the findings? I can't seem to access that. Can you help us out, Phil? Absolutely. So the hearing took place on 6-7, if memory serves, and there were uh, five citations involved. Let's see, we had one citation 5Z ending in 4-4, public nuisance was dismissed. One citation 4Z-4-3, animal disturbance was dismissed. One citation 3Z ending in 4-2, public safety threat was dismissed. One citation 2Z ending in 4-1, public safety threat was dismissed. And the last citation 1Z ending in 4-0, animal at large was upheld. Fines were reduced to half. Okay, thank you. Any other questions at this time? I have one quick question, uh, Ms. Smilowitz. In your video, uh, um, you know, you had your video on. I was surprised. I thought we were just going to see, you know, just hear some audio. Was there not an opportunity to, you know, identify this animal with your video at the time? I mean, I, it would it would definitely help this committee to see which animal we're talking about to verify that that this is the exact animal. Um. So that particular video, um, because it happened after um, the June 6th situation um, in which the BICE has provided video of their dog, um, uh, my, the reason that I recorded it as I, I, number one, I was trying to get away um, that if you, if that clip was a little longer, you would have seen going in my house. I have a, uh, a umbrella stand filled with walking canes because I can't, I got into this motor vehicle accident and I shattered my leg. So there's no getting out of the way of this animal. The, the point that I was making was to get the sound of the dog very agitated and it's sleepy. I, I I can't, there is no visual of it. I put my phone on as I was walking to, to get the noise. Um, okay. That's fine. Just, I, that, you, I mean, you don't need to explain any more than that. I just was interested okay. to know. I, I understand. I mean, there's a lot of situations you, if you're fearful, I understand. I'm not blaming or pointing. I'm just asking oh. the question. Um, I do have uh, one other question was, um, just so I understand the testimony, in, when this happened, um, Mr. Bice brought the animal down. He was still standing on the sidewalk. The animal was in his control. I mean, not to your, and when I say in his control, he had hold of the leash and the animal was at the full extension of the leash based on what you've said and the letter. And he, the, the animal was on your grass. Is that correct? Correct. With its uh, rear paw, the, its front paws off the ground. That's how taut the leash was. Okay. But Mr. So Bice was himself was on the sidewalk. Is that correct? Um, I believe he was, yes, but the dog was not. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Weiss, I see you have your hand raised. Could you um, just wait uh, until the uh, uh, defendant states, you know, you're part of the defense to state your case, and then you, each party will have uh, an opportunity to ask questions of the other. So um, I have a question. Um, the area in which uh, this took place in which you guys uh, live. Um, I understood uh, Mr. Bice when he stated his address said apartment. Is this considered an apartment complex or exactly uh, what is, is it an apartment complex? I guess that's my question. Yes, it is. Well, uh, I'm asking Ms. Smilowitz just Apparently, where Mr. Bice is located right now is um, this is a picture of 
Oh, here we go. Let me unblur this thing again. This is a picture of my home. It's a single family home development in Arnold. Okay. Um, that's my okay. home. Okay. It's um, a, and there's an apartment complex or, uh, near it or. No, no. Uh, apparently Mr. Bice is not located in the neighborhood anymore since this. Uh, when when this took place though it's just what we're what what i'm getting at where where was where was he located in your map you had two uh yellow houses yeah yeah and and that's where he resided you're saying and yes well i i don't know that um but i mean it's coming as a surprise to me that he didn't give his okay, that, overly that's that's a question probably better suited for the defense when uh so just yeah there's a yeah that's me these uh -huh. are single family houses and that's the vices it's they are across the street and five houses down their okay. home okay okay well and that'd probably be a better question suited for the defense when uh so uh can we move on with the, the defendant's uh, side of the story here? Um, Mr. Ham uh, Dr. Hammer, I see you have your hand raised again. Yeah, just have a, a follow-up question, if you please. Um, Ms. Smolowitz, it, it says in your written testimony that you were told to adjust your behavior, both of you were told to adjust your behavior to avoid the situation from occurring. Um, where did that, who told you to do that? Where did that come from? Um, the, um, the hearing, I understood the here, the last hearing that we had, um, in which, um, part of the, um, resolution, um, and I believe Mr. Evans was on that call. Um, and a lot of what I recall Mr. Evans speaking the most, um, in what he said about it being neighborly and trying to get back to, you know, having a neighborly interaction with one another. Um, I was pretty emotional on the other um, hearing. Um, and what I understood Mr. Evans to say, as well as the other people that were on the call was basically to adjust behavior so that you know, we weren't having interactions. Um, that okay, and the hear and the hearing you're referring to is the one on uh, six June. seven twenty twenty, correct? Correct. Okay, great. Then I guess the second question I have is probably maybe for Phil. Do we have anybody from the office of law there, Phil, or on this call? Yes, sir. Then the question I have for the uh, for the county attorney is: Can dogs trespass? Um, so I am filling in for Kern Ritter, um, and I, I'll look into it right now. I'll, I can get back to you, but um, I, I don't usually do animal control, so I want to make sure I'm giving you the right answer, um, and I'll look into it right now and get back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sure. for, the, th th thank you for the time, Mr. Evans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if there are nothing further, uh, I believe it's time for us to hear from the defendant, Mr. Bryce, Ms. Bryce, uh, I guess uh, whoever wishes to start first, I guess that would be Mr. Bryce. Uh, yes, so so I will start. So um, just for clarity, um, yes, there, uh, at the date of the event, I was living at 247 Overleaf Drive, uh, the address that Jamie, you have pointed out. Unfortunately, uh, as of March the 12th of this year, I moved to the Admiral Cochran uh, address that I stated. Um, you know, that's where I that's where I am now. That's that's where I've been living since. But the date of the incident, I was living at 247 Overleaf Drive. Uh, I want to start by saying that um, at the beginning of Jamie's letter, she mentioned that I was in my car driving. So yes, I was in my car driving back to my house. It was about 3, 3.30. It was about three o'clock as, as she stated. Uh, in the afternoon, it was a Sunday afternoon. It was sunny, it was clear. Um, 
when I was just driving back to my house, I just noticed someone on the sidewalk. I always look to see who is walking or, um, you know, what they, you know, what, who they're, you know, pulling or who they're walking. Um, I didn't feel like, uh, I, well, I did not uh, make any gestures. I did not, uh, my windows were up. I didn't make any um, uh, mouth motions, nor did I make a sound when I was in the car. I was just normally driving down the street at that time, driving back to my house. I got back to my house and uh, I did get sleepy. Um, she had been uh, in the house by herself for a few hours. So I got back to the house and I immediately put on uh, her leash and, and, and started on a walk. Now we are, we live on uh, the, uh, we live across the street from one another on different sides of the street. When I'm walking sleepy, she is a hound dog. She is also between 45 and 50 pounds, not the weight that Jamie stated in the letter, um, but she is a hound dog and she has part beagle in her. So um, I just wanna state that, um, you know, she, she is a hound dog and, and yes, she does bark. She barks at, you know, other animals and other people. She doesn't know them. Yes. So when I walk sleepy, we always take just about the same route when we're coming down the street towards Jamie's house, but on the other side of the street, we always come down that sidewalk down to where the court is uh, right at 267 Overleaf Drive. Um, and then sometimes we'll go up a little bit further or sometimes Sleepy wants to go down the court. Sometimes Sleepy wants to cross the street over on the side of the street where Jamie lives and either go up or then come back. She likes to sniff and just uh, get the sniffs and the smells uh, on both sides of the street. So ever since, you know, I've been walking her, this is the route that we normally take. So I, I did nothing um, in terms of the uh, the walking route that day, I did nothing out of the ordinary uh, at that time. Now, um, uh, I did submit uh, four photos uh, with some notes on them, and I would uh, like photo one to be shown so I can talk through. So, so I, I, I believe the photos will speak to you know the positioning of where I was and where everybody was during the events that, that were mentioned. So if we could see um, photo one, please, that'd be great. Okay, so you see here, I'm pointing, um, I'm, I'm staying, so I took these pictures uh, after the incident. This wasn't the day of the incident, but when I got the letter uh, that I was going to be uh, here in the hearing, um, I, I uh, went up and I took pictures at the different places where, uh, you know, things occurred and to also show you uh, what I'll be talking about. So this was the first uh, place where she said her neighbor, Mike, uh, or her neighbor was out in front and she was out in front talking. We were standing right where I've got the arrow down and Sleepy was on the leash. I had control of the leash and I was standing on the sidewalk and she was into that the grassy area between the sidewalk and the curb. Yes, she did. She what did bark because she noticed something or somebody that either was an animal and which uh, Jamie had, and someone that uh, she, you know she didn't, you know, kind of sort of have a daily interaction with. But um, she barked a few times, and I just I gave her commands calmly as the uh, lead uh, pet co trainer mentioned that you know don't you know, just give a, a, the straight commands, you know, soft, not softly, but, you know, give the commands, but not in an elevated voice. And then I started walking and I uh, got a tug on the leash and we continued on our walk. So this was the first position. And as you see, the other arrow is where Jamie and her neighbor were standing uh, when uh, we were at this position and Sleepy was barking. So we were uh, up about one house as you can tell by the driveways uh, from where they were when Sleepy was barking. Um, if we can show a uh, photo too, please. Okay, so on that day, 
we did cross the street at that point. We didn't go down the court or do the other things. We crossed the street onto Jamie's side of the street. We went up the street further away from Jamie's house and then we circled back. This is again, normal for uh, Sleepy's walk when, when I take her for a walk. She likes to, she likes to roam and, and sniff, as I mentioned. So as you can see, I, I know that in the letter, um, Jamie mentioned that I didn't cross the street or go into the street. Um, well, as you can see from this vantage point, which um, Jamie's house is what you can see the side part and the neighbor that I pointed out the last time, that's his house uh, with the brownish shutters on the right. And as you can tell, I, at this, from this vantage point, I couldn't tell that Jamie was still outside. Um, I probably would have crossed the street, but there were a couple of other factors on that day. There were cars parked on both curbs on the side. And as you can tell, this road, Overleaf Drive, curves to the right. And I didn't feel like it was safe um, to actually go in the street or try to cross uh, for risk of getting hit by a car either coming down the hill, because this is a hill going downward this way, or a car coming around the bend uh, and, and we come out from between cars or behind a car, whichever, however they were parked here. But I do remember cars parked on the curb on both sides of the street. That's a normal occurrence um, on weekends or in the evenings after work hours. So I, can, I continue to stay on the sidewalk. I, um, and we just continued on because at this point I could not see Jamie. So can you um, show photo three, please? Okay, so this is coming up to Jamie's property. Um, I believe it's pretty close to the property line. The electrical box or the fuse box there on the right is just before her property actually starts. So I, again, I did not see the tree. She stated she was in the driveway, which um, I, I couldn't tell at this point. And so again, I kept, I continued on. I didn't even see the neighbor that she was talking to um, that she mentioned and the neighbor who actually uh, brought the letter or you know, uh, submitted the letter, the notarized letter. So at this point, I still could not see, I didn't see Jamie. And so again, I continued with Sleepy down the sidewalk and you can see the width of the sidewalk and that's gonna, um, that's gonna be important for the next uh, photo, thank you. Yes, can you get a four? Okay, thank you. Okay, so at this this vantage point, again, it's not the day of the occurrence. I took these pictures uh, afterwards. I am standing on the sidewalk. And so when I did realize, when I came about past the tree, I did see Jamie coming up her, her uh, concrete steps. There are stone steps. And so when I got in front of the house, um, I well before I got in front of the house what I normally do when sleepy sees either a squirrel another dog a neighbor that she's not familiar with if I feel like she's um, you know there, there's going to be you know barking involved I will always take the leash and I will wrap it around my, around my wrist at least once most of the time twice and I'm actually still holding the loop um, the the leash is a is a a, a new leash um, I can't I do not know how long the leash is. So yes, yeah, Sleepy did uh, start barking. She did um, pull and uh, she did uh, put her uh, paws in the grass in front, of, uh, in front of this part here, but I stayed on the sidewalk and I still had a firm command and control of the leash at that time. After I uh, you know, figured out what was going on, I again, as in the first, uh, the first photo I showed, I gave her commands uh, not loudly, not uh, hysterically, or you know, with raised voice. I gave her the commands as we were trained by the Petco trainer, and then I started walking and gave a tug on the leash, and we kept going uh, down the street. Um, I did not recall hearing Jamie ever saying, uh, "You're trespassing on my property." Um, but again, I was still on the sidewalk, and Sleepy's paws uh, did. Uh, touched her her um, her lawn there in her grass until I gave her the commands and then we started walking down again with the leash firmly in my control with the with the rope with the or with the leash wrapped around, wrapped around my wrist one or two times. All right, thank you. That's the, so. Those are the pictures uh, that I wanted to show. Um, 
the other thing she um J jamie mentioned in her uh testimony and also I, I read in the letter that was submitted um that this was an attack the first time um and and there's um uh, in the incidents that philip um officer hall uh read off um it was not found by the commission here uh, during that hearing that it was an actual attack. It was not proven that Sleepy uh, bit the dog or bit Jamie. Uh, the incident happened with my children. Uh, at the time, they were eight years old and 12 years old, and the leash got away. The eight-year-old, my eight-year-old daughter had the leash at that time. So that's the previous case, but it was found uh, not to be a bite, and there was no proof. And so, um, I'm I'm disputing uh, the word attack. Um, I feel like it's um, uh, you know uh, more than what actually occurred during that incident. Um, so um, again, as I mentioned, I, I just have a, a few notes here uh, that I was taking. So um, Jamie mentioned that, she, that I was walking towards her while I was on the sidewalk the whole time, um, and I and she was on the stone steps. So I, I never once went up her driveway or up her stone steps. And as you saw in picture or photo number four, that was the closest distance I ever was to Jamie and her dog. I also, when I looked at Jamie and Miley, uh, when we got in front of the house, I didn't uh, see fear or interpret fear or, or being scared. Um, they were both standing on the stone steps. Jamie and Miley were standing on the stone steps and they were just standing uh, calmly. Now, I'm, I can't judge what was going on inside of them, but I did not see fear and, I, and, and Jamie never said anything to me. Like I mentioned, she never said, your tr uh, sleepy is trespassing on my lawn. Again, I was on the sidewalk and I had the leash firmly in control. Sleepy never got off the leash or got loose uh, whatsoever during this incident. Um, and as I mentioned before, she's she and the neighbor in the letter that the neighbor submitted mentioned that I should have moved in the street or cross the street was well, I mentioned there were cars on on the curb on both sides of the street. And if I would have seen Jamie further up, I probably would have tried to. But again, there's a curve in the in the street, there was cars there. And I didn't feel like it was safe to do because we have we do have some uh, issues of, you know, cars, you know, uh, uh, going over the speed limit or what we think is over the speed limit. And I just did not want to take the chance of of either myself or Sleepy getting hit by a car. So I just said, I said to myself, stay on the sidewalk, get a firm handle on the leash, as I mentioned, and we continued uh, in front of Jamie's house, um, as I mentioned. And again, uh, you know, the commands that I made uh, was not with raised voice. I made them uh, down to Sleepy and I gave the commands in a calm uh, manner without raised voice as instructed by the lead Petco trainer that we got after the last hearing um, that that we that we talked about when Jamie was testifying. So um, I didn't feel like I needed to raise my voice. And again, she's 45, 50 pounds. Um, she's not going to, you know, I don't feel she's she would out muscle me. She is a strong dog and has strong legs. And I just, again, uh, gave the commands. And then I started walking and gave a tug on the leash and continued up the street. Um, uh, adjust behavior. Um, Jamie mentioned that we should have been adjusting the behavior. One thing that I uh, I believe from my memory that from the last hearing commission, I did specifically ask about staying on the sidewalk or walking on the sidewalk because I interpreted or I thought that the, you know staying on the sidewalk is or being on the sidewalk is public property. So again, the day of this incident, when I realized Jamie and Miley were there, I made sure that I stood, I stayed on the sidewalk and I did not go into the yard and go any closer to Jamie, but Sleepy did go off because of the length of the leash. Um, and again, as I mentioned, I never did hear Jamie say, you are trespassing or get off my lawn or anything like that. She and Miley were just standing there on the stone steps and I gave my commands in a calm manner. And then I started walking and pulled in and gave a tug on the leash and we continued on our way um, uh, up to the sidewalk, down the sidewalk towards our house uh, at that time. So 
that, that's that's what I have to uh, to say in this matter. Um, I, I believe I've um, uh, mentioned everything that that I needed to mention. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, uh, Ms. Weiss, uh, you've had your hand raised for some time now. So uh... um, the reason I raised my hand was um, answered already, but I, I did have a little more to add. I, I wasn't with Stan on this walk, but um, just to clarify a couple of things, um, the, the commission that she had mentioned before um, was actually, we had two, two incidents. We, um, an, one officer um, cleared us the first time. Um, it was just an, um, a review um, of the case. And then she, I guess, appealed and went over that one to the animal commission, which is the first one we had. It wasn't an appeal. I hear her shaking her head. So um, she went back and, and did it a second for a second charge on them. Um, anyway, so it was twice that um, for the first incident that Sleepy was cleared, except for being off leash um, from the children. And at the at the other commission, um, Dr. Hemmer, you asked if we were told to adjust our behavior, and Jamie said that the resolution was to be neighborly, so we weren't having interactions but they actually kind of i thought jamie my understanding was they were trying to impress upon us that we are supposed to be trying to work things out not avoiding each other but to the best of our ability talking with each other to resolve these things rather than continuing to go this route um and a couple of things also that she had mentioned was that um, I don't know if she remembered Stan or she was talking about Stan or Sleepy, but she likened this to stalking and that maybe Stan was antagonizing Sleepy. And in just the past court cases here, the other court case we had last week, we keep hearing from the legal people that you cannot, um, you can't give definitions to other people's intent. And that's important to me because we are not, we're not trying to antagonize her. Um, as a matter of fact, the kids and I, we try very hard to take Sleepy out. When we do walk her up the street, we try very hard to do it at times um, early in the morning when we know Jamie's not, not up and out yet or in the early afternoon when she's not there. Um, just because although we don't have to give the space while we're out in public, we are, are trying to because we know that Sleepy scares her. Um, Sleepy does bark. Um, but for the most part, the kids and I keep the dog down on our end of the street and kind of walk around um, this dead end. And um, honestly, we're scared um, to do this. I mean, I know that she's feeling all of these things with what's happening, but our family is as well. And we're trying very hard um, just to keep that from all happening, continuing to happen. Um, we've worked with the trainer, we've kept working with Sleepy, but we keep being told um, by trainers too that we can't stop a dog from barking. Um, if you have more resources or things you could give us that could help with that, we're open to that as well. Um, I, I think that's everything. It's just in the history. We're trying to work this out, but um, I, we're just not sure what, what to do because Sleepy is under control when we all have her out. Thank you. Okay, I just, I, I, have, I have to ask this, uh, this question. I hope it's not too personal, but um, Mr. Bryce, your, your address changed. Um, is, is Sleepy with you or is, is Sleepy still at, in Arnold or with you on Co Admiral Cochran Drive? Sleepy is still in Arnold. I, I, okay. I do not have that's, an animal that's what here. You need to say. Okay. I understand. Uh, thank you for that. All right. Uh, is there anything else um, on the defense side? I see uh, Ms. Smilowitz has her hand raised. I will go to her uh, in a second, uh, unless any of the commissioners have a question on the uh, defense uh, case. Real quick, can you guys hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, just a question uh, for Mr. Bites. How long is that leash? Is it a standard 36 inch type leash or is it like a retractable leash that extends? It is not a retractable leash. It is, I would say it's more like a, a rope or polyester rope ish. Uh, so it's not retractable. I, you know, I, I, it, and I believe it's a standard length. Um, I, unfortunately, I, I didn't uh, measure the leash uh, before today just to give context on that, but it's not an extra long leash. It's a standard length leash from the other leashes that we've had on Sleepy. This, this is a relatively new leash since the uh, training with the, um, uh, the Petco trainer. The collar and the leash are both new from last year. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anything else, commissioners? Okay, seeing none, uh, Ms. Smolowitz, do you have any questions of the uh, defense? Um, just um, in terms of the recollection um, or Stan's description of what happened and where I was at, at different points, um, um, I was standing I have to say thank you, Stan, for the pictures because I didn't take the pictures. They were, for the most part, very accurate, um, except for two things. When he was on Silverleaf Court, he was on the far end of the street of Silverleaf Court um, when he and Sleepy were noticed, or when Sleepy noticed Miley and I. Um, and I, more importantly, when I was in my driveway or when um, the neighbor said Sleepy's behind you, I was standing at the bottom of my driveway. Um, there were no cars. Um, we live on a dead end. So pretty much the only cars that come into our street are the people that live here. Um, it is not an active street without a doubt. Um, he could have safely I believe could have safely crossed the street. Um, there were no cars from the entire time of the incident that came down that street because, um, you know, I was in the process of communicating. We were talking, my ne other neighbor and I, uh, Mark and I were chatting and no car cut in front of us to interrupt our conversation. Um, but most importantly, I was at the base of my driveway. I was at the bottom of my hill. He, you know, what, how he described the, the street, absolutely accurate. You know, it's a, it's a rounded corner, but where he was standing, you have, unless I'm way up in my driveway, which at that point I wasn't because I didn't even know he was behind me because the last time I saw him, he was across the street, walking out of the street, walking away from the dead end. So you know, I just was in shock. Um, I, I was in complete shock and fear of, I couldn't even process. Um, and I said nothing because I, I literally, with my mouth open was, oh my God, I cannot believe this is happening given what had happened last time and given what's gone on since. Um, to just make one comment about the previous, for whatever reason, the vet, um, the vet bill from the previous and attack, the dog attacked us, um, was not, even though I entered it into evidence, it somehow did not get to Mr. Hall. Um, and I had asked him to please include that this time. Um, I had asked him by email. Um, not that it's relevant to this situation with Mr. Bice on, on November 28th, it was relevant to the other one. Um, so I, I just wanna say that there is um, a vet interaction um, from the previous situation. Um, I have not, the dog has been running loose on two other occasions um, loose with no, no anything, no human around other than trying to get her. Um, so. Okay, we, we, we don't have an at large, uh, citation in front of us today. So, 
I mean that that you can you can speak on that, but that that's not in front of us today. Uh, I understand that. I just want to say that, and I I haven't. I I didn't file another um, affidavit of the dates, um, but I just want to say that 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 has been happening. Um, so. Um, I'm sorry, there was something else I wanted to say and I apologize. Um, oh, in terms of just adjusting behavior, if I see them, I look out my window to see if I see them, I open the door and I look to see if I see them as I'm preparing to walk with my dog. If I see them, I go back in the house. I'm not, I don't even bother going outside. I know that they're gonna take their walk. They'll be, I don't pay 100% attention, but you know, it's usually walks are probably half an hour or so. So I don't even try to go out, you know, for at least an hour or two. Um, you know, and so I totally adjust my behavior to not interact with them at all. I, I don't put myself in that situation. It's not worth it to me. So. Okay. Um, thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Bryce, uh, well, Mr. Bryce, actually, um, do, do either of you have uh, questions for the complainant? Okay, you may, you may uh, state your questions. Yes, um, Jamie, the video that you showed with uh, the dog barking in the background, and we could see your, uh, your steps and then the front door when you were unlocking the door. Um, was that on the day of the incident? No, I had said that that was not on the date of the incident. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to make sure. So that video and the sound was not on the day of the incident. It was an, another occurrence, another day, a different day uh, later, correct? Correct, but that is what Sleepy sounded like that day. Okay, thank you. Um, so when she, when Jamie was just uh, speaking and, and, and um, in terms of uh, the facts that I provided, uh, the photo one is actually where I was standing. She says I was in the far side of the court. That was not correct. I was standing uh, there on the, the first, the front corner closest to my, my uh, house and Jamie's house. I was on that corner at that time. So that picture is from where the uh, first barking uh, occurred, uh, not on the far, uh, which is across the, 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 court, the street of the court. Um, I was on the, the, the closer side of that. Um, again, I'm going to state that when we were approaching uh, Jamie's house on that side, I was on the sidewalk and I had the leash. Um, I had Sleepy on the leash uh, firmly under control but I did not see her at the bottom of the driveway. But as I showed video, or excuse me, photo four, or you could see kind of photo three, the, the bottom of the driveway as, as Jamie is claiming, photo four, where I had the arrow where Jamie and Miley was standing. Um, so she, what she's claiming to me is that, I, you know, in one house length, she went from the bottom of her driveway up the hill and then up a couple of steps by the time I got in front of her now she, in front of her house I mean I, I understand and I'm very sympathetic and you know, I understand that she um, cannot move uh, quickly um, but that's to me that's a pretty good distance um, in the shorter time that I came but again when I stated that I did not see her <clears throat> at the neighbor's house and I didn't see her went as we as we were approaching her um, lawn I did not see her at that time it wasn't until we got a little bit further and I saw her and my decision was to stay on the sidewalk and continue down the public sidewalk and not risk crossing the street uh, with cars and I understand but we have we do have times of neighbors you know where cars are coming from uh, two different angles and, and they're coming at a, at a decent rate of speed. I'm not gonna say they're speeding. Uh, I, can't, uh, I can't say that, but I just did not feel comfortable uh, going out in the street. And so I decided to stand my ground and stay on the sidewalk and continue down the public sidewalk with Sleepy. Okay. Um, anything else before we uh, move to deliberation? 
I'm just gonna say, if you don't mind, and I apologize, um, the neighbor witnessed where I was and wrote that in his letter of where I was standing when Stan came into our view and where I was in conjunction to where Stan was. So, I, I you know, I was right there. He absolutely saw me. Um, so, and he stopped in front of my driveway once I had backed up and was standing. I was not as far as he said I was up my steps um, because I was trying to stay near my car because that that's kind of like my, my only safe place at that point was the car. So, okay. and I knew I wasn't going to get to my door and unlock it quick enough. So I, I think we're, we're pretty well, uh, okay. pretty well good on both of your positions on that particular matter. Uh, Ms. Bice, I see you, you. Yeah, I just, uh, it's the same point. You can stop me if, if you want, but, um, the witness statement said she, when Stan was in front of her house, that Jamie was going up her front steps. She wasn't at the base of the driveway. Is it what the letter from her witness said? Okay. That's all. I, th I think we're pretty clear with your, or both parties' positions on, on everything. Uh, the matter, uh, I believe we're, we're about ready to close for deliberation on this, uh, on this matter. Uh, I'll give anybody at all the commissioners, the complainant, the defendant, um, one last chance for anything that we have not heard yet. Uh, with, okay, Ms. Mendelowitz. I'm sorry, just in terms of um, um, feeling safe around sleepy in the future, um, my dog, Sleepy gets agitated by, I don't believe it's me. I think it's my dog who doesn't bark, um, doesn't, she's not aggressive at all, um, is potentially um, to use a muzzle so that if Sleepy should get loose again, that, you know, even if she's, you know, on us, that we're not going to get bit. Um, th that is uh, potentially a request. I mean, it's a request, you know, to just feel safe, I guess. Um, so that that's all I wanted to say. I understand. Okay, with that, uh, I think we're gonna move uh, to uh, deliberate on this matter. The commission will be deliberating. Um, once we start deliberation, there will be no further input. Um, I'm pretty sure we're all clear on the issues here. So uh, let us move for final deliberation on this, the commission. And um, uh, Matthew, I guess we'll start with you, buddy. Hey, sorry, my headphones might die in the middle of this. Um, I think it's tough. I think it's kind of a he said, she said situation right now. And we don't really have a lot of clear evidence aside from the letter. And I think intentions on both sides could be misinterpreted. So I don't really see clear evidence of a public nuisance or whatever the other charge was. So I'd be up for dismissal. I'd also like to hear everyone else's thoughts. Okay, thank you. Um, Jennifer? Um, I don't share Mr. Shyrock's opinion. Um, you know, the one thing that there's no dispute on is that the encounter occurred and it occurred on the complainant's side of the street. Um, so for me, that speaks volumes. Um, you know, I remember this case the first time around um, and I, I did, you know, I felt sorry for these folks because I, I felt like it was trust issues and I, it was sad to see um, a neighborly relationship go south like this. Um, but in, in my opinion, if you know that the complainant is frightened of your dog and it causes this kind of trauma, why would you walk it um, in front of her house? There's not a reason in the world why he had to be on that side of the street. He could have 
continued on on the other side of the street and at least put some distance. I understand from the layout of the neighborhood that it's kind of impossible for the two of them to walk their dogs without crossing each other, um, but he could have maintained more distance um, and he certainly didn't need to stop. And in my opinion, if yes, the sidewalk is public, um, but if you are walking the dog on her side of the street in front of her house and you stop, um, that's antagonizing. I think that's harassment. Um, and I would be 100% inclined to uphold these citations. Okay. Um, Mr. Berger, Tom's. Um, well, I, I disagree with Jennifer quite a bit there. Um, I do believe the pictures say a lot. And actually, before I get started, I wanted to point out also that um, Ms. Ms. Choxel from the law office did chime in in the chat. I don't know if everyone saw that. The trespassing is something an animal can do. I want to make sure everyone saw that. Um, although we're not here for an animal trespass, as far as I understand. Um, the pictures to me speak a lot. And I, I believe personally, the man should, you know, while it may be prudent for him not to walk on the other side of the street, he has every right to do so. While that dog is under his control, if his dog is barking and he needs to gain control of that animal before he moves forward, I can see a case for that. Um, seeing the curve of that street and not knowing exactly what happened when, if she was speaking to a neighbor across the street, that neighbor across the street would have seen him approaching before she did. He warned her, she moved. If he didn't see her, he didn't see her. I, I have no way to, to prove one way or the other if he did or didn't see her. I would agree with you, Jennifer, that if, if, he, if it was proven somehow that he saw her, that it was anti antagonizing. But if he didn't know she was there to the last second, I don't, I, I don't know how, you know, if he thinks it's clear to walk by, it's, it's, it's a, you know, 100 meter, 100 yard stretch of a road around a bend. And I, I believe that if he didn't see her, then he didn't see her. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I can't, I wasn't there. I don't have eyes, but I can see how if the neighbor across the street saw it first. Um, as far as animal disturbance prohibited, isn't is that usually what we, we hear for barking dogs? I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I know that in this case, her concern that wasn't with like the barking per se as a, a volume issue or as a disturbance to her in a way, like, as I've dealt with it before, I feel like that's usually used um, as in like, it's disturbing the peace, not um, I'm fearful because this animal is barking. Um, so I'd have a real hard time upholding that one. The public nuisance, like I said, if we could prove any intent here, I would be more inclined to uphold that. But I personally, in this case, I agree. It would be definitely more prudent for him to stay away from that side of the road. But in that situation, I guess the one question that, that does come to my mind that maybe you know we can discuss a little bit is, I mean, if his animal's acting the way it was, and I don't think anyone was disputing that the dog was acting crazy, he had the dog in his, his control. He never left the sidewalk. Is it prudent for him then to get his dog under control and move forward or move forward at the same time? I mean, in one dis description, it, this, this, this took place from two to five minutes. Two to five minutes is an, is an eternity. So I'm not, you know, I'm not really clear. And you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know. But that, that's kind of where I'm at. We can discuss it further with everybody. But that's kind of some of the points that I thought of. All right. Um, Corporal. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm kind of on the same page with Mr. Berger. Um, just thinking about it, like we're talking about, he was on the sidewalk. That's why I asked him how long the leash was, like how far was this dog onto her property? She said, um, the problem with the whole trespassing thing is, you know, the, the way we've always viewed it is her property has to be posted, no trespassing. She has to be warned that, or the individual has to be warned not to trespass. So, He's on a public sidewalk. You're definitely right, Ms. Chen, that he should, you know, uh, out of respect, walk on the other side of the street. I know if I was in that kind of situation, I would. But at the end of the day, we can't tell him, hey, you can't walk up the sidewalk or, hey, you can't walk down your street. Um, and I was just trying to read over, like, the, the verbatim for each one. And it's really hard to stretch the even the public nuisance one where it says the quiet of a person. I mean, this is the middle of the day, correct? They said it was in the afternoon. So I could see if it was 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, that could be presented of, okay, you're keeping people up. You have a loud hound dog. I understand this dog and it's part beagle, he said. So they make lots of noise. Um, I find it hard to try to uphold both of those. But he's on a curve. He's just walking down a public sidewalk that he's allowed to. So if this is an ongoing thing, then I could say, yeah, that you're being a nuisance. You're constantly disturbing. But it's kind of hard for just this one incident to say that. 
Thank you. Can I just um, real quick point out, because there's a section of the code I think we're missing. Um, in the very beginning of the code, under the definitions, it's 12.4.101, there is a definition of public nuisance, and that may or may not um, change folks' minds, but I think that's it's important to read that in conjunction with the other piece of the statute, because um, it does say an act by an animal that substantially interferes with the rights of citizens to enjoyment of life or property that unreasonably annoys human, including the, the molesting of pedestrians. Um, and I had read that in preparation for this hearing, so that was in the back of my mind as I was um, listening to this. Um, and I think it's just an important piece that we have to consider as well. Okay, Jennifer. Um, Dr. Hammer? Thank you. Um, I tend to, well, first off, I'm saddened by the whole thing that we can't get two people to take reasonable steps for everybody to, to live comfortably and in peace together. That, that On a personal level, that bothers me. But as I look at the facts and the matter at hand, um, I'm having a tough time with the animal disturbance um, charge. I don't think enough evidence has been presented to make me feel comfortable in going forward on that one. The public nuisance one bothers me a little bit. I hear what Jennifer's saying, and I can't really disagree with her. Um, and I'm getting a sense, at least based on what little I've heard from the episodes that occurred on 6-7, that we are starting to get a history here. So, so we are starting to see a, um, a pattern develop. And so I'm a little bit more inclined um, to dismiss the the animal disturbance because I don't believe enough evidence in my opinion has been presented to be able to uh, affirm that. But the public nuisance, I'm, I'm a little bit more comfortable with because I do think this dog is, is developing a history of creating a problem for this one neighbor and her, you know, her, her legal right to enjoy the privacy and peace of her neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Lauren? Sorry, can you hear me? Oh. Yeah, she, she's not actually part of the uh, panel. She's just a representative from the Office of Law. Yeah, okay. so any questions, I'm here. I'm okay. just filling in for Curran. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, Okay, I, I appreciate uh, all of your input on that. My, um, for what it's worth, um, I do uh, sympathize with the complainants. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the right word to use. Her uh, sensitivity, I guess, would be um, to her inability to run away or uh, get shelter from a possible um, incident. Um, on the same hand, I don't think that we can move forward on the possibility or the ifs and buts uh, of the situation. Um, I'm thankful that nothing occurred uh, here, but I really don't think that there is enough evidence uh, that the possibility uh, was there for anything further to have occurred than what did occur. Um, we can't right now, as it stands, unfortunately, um, I heard the request for a muzzle, which obviously would make her feel good. But uh, as we know, you know, when you put a muzzle on a dog that is not used to a muzzle, they reject it. And um, it makes them feel uncomfortable. And no dog owner wants to uh, slap a muzzle on their dog and have them shaking their head and, and feeling uncomfortable. It's just not, uh, it's not something a dog owner wants to do to their pet. Um, in short, it, it just makes me feel uncomfortable uh, myself. Uh, to uphold either one of the uh, citations, because I don't think that uh, uh, the testimony from the defendant, he had, he did have full control uh, of the dog. Uh, 
hound dogs are hunting dogs, I guess you would call them. Um, and they, they sniff and, and they bark at other uh, animals, be it a squirrel, um, uh, another dog, another, you know, a person or uh, whatever. Um, the defendant also stated that uh, he talked to it softly to try to calm it down, which is good because if you holler and yell at it, it just exacerbates the situation. Um, in my opinion, I, I, I found that to be true. When you, I believe we had a case uh, a while ago where an argument ensued in front of a dog and things got really, really bad because voices were raised and everything. So I appreciated that. Um, in short, uh, I, just, I just have to say with, with what I've seen, and the evidence, the barking wasn't wasn't what we have seen as as a disturbance, um, and I do agree with uh, with Dr. Hemmer and and the rest of the commission on the point. With you know, I, I certainly wish that uh, you know we can we can have a mutual respect here and acknowledge that um, this particular neighbor has uh, reservations about, uh, you know, about aggressiveness of, of animals when she's used to her dog uh, being a rather docile animal, so, and her inability to run away. So in short, um, I'm uncomfortable with upholding either, either citation as just myself. Um, so. Ed, can I, can I, before we move on anymore, I, I um, two things I wanna bring up, one, and I wanted to say this during the presentation. I know they're, they're listening to us now. I know he mentioned PetSmart as training. And I know generally speaking as a commission, we don't, that's not, a, that's not an ideal trainer, training situation. So while we do applaud them trying to look for help, obviously somebody with a little more training than someone from PetSmart. Um, I know she'd asked about the barking issue. I'm sure that there's trainers out there that are, that are more than qualified to do that. Um, I'm sure if you reached out to Animal Control directly, we can be able to you know, we can kind of advise you there. I do think, you know, based on what you said, Jennifer, and looking at the, you know, molesting, uh, what, what's the, what's the term molesting a, uh, uh, molesting pedestrians, pedestrian, that's the term. Okay. So I kind of want to talk about this a little bit. Like I said, we were kind of on opposite sides of things here to, to an extent. And I want to, you know, I'd like to open it up a little bit, but, you know, to me, this situation, I think of it almost like a barking dog. If this guy brought this dog out in front of her house every day and let the dog sit there and try to get at her every time he saw her and he took that opportunity, then I'm all on board with that. I mean, that's kind of where I'm seeing it. In this situation, if he didn't even know she was there and came around the corner, I have a really hard, that, this, that's where I have a hard time with it. If he was, you know, he claims he was unaware. None of us know if he was truly aware or not that dog was there. If, he, if it were, you know, that's where we're at. So, I mean, I, I don't know if we can open this discussion up a little bit about that, but that's where I'm kind of hung up on it. I could go, you know, I could definitely vote for upholding the, the public nuisance if I felt like he was, in, you know, in, antagonizing her again and again and again on purpose. But because he does have the right to be there and maybe didn't see her there and did what he had to do in that situation to get his dog moving again, I, I have a hard time faulting him for that. So that's where I mean, if we can discuss that a little bit, I mean, how do you feel about if you look at it that way? How would you, I mean, I can see what you're saying for sure. Just because he has the right to do something doesn't mean he should. Um, well, and, again, I mean, and it, I feel like, well, I guess, you know, I, I don't mean to sound overly dramatic, but, you know, it's almost like weaponizing this dog. I mean, he knows this woman is terrified of this dog. And from what I understand, and maybe I heard testimony wrong, but he was on the other side of the street initially. Well, first of all, I mean, he drove past and he saw her outside. So he knew she was outside at some point. At some point, and he, yes. And he started out on the other side of the street, but he made a decision instead of staying on that side of the street and continuing his walk, he decided to cross the street and come over to her house. And to me, that's intentional. Why else would, why would if you he do didn't, that? When he, he said in the mission, when he crossed the street, he went further up the road. Time passes, he comes back around. He doesn't see her when he approaches. If he doesn't see her, then he doesn't see her. I mean, I can't, I, I wasn't there again. He doubled I back. 
He was right. further up the road, but he had to double back to come back in front of her house. He did, but he said when he crossed over, he said he went further and then came back down on the same side. And then at the what sells me again is the picture. If you go back and look at the picture as you approach that house from more than halfway across the property before it, you know where exactly she was at the time versus when the guy told her across the street where you know where he was approaching from. It's hard for me to sit here and say that he knew for sure. I would fully agree if we could prove that he knew, if he admitted, yes, I saw her as I was approaching and I decided to walk my dog here anyway, then I fully agree with you. But if he did not see her, whether he saw her walking earlier, whether he saw her as he walked by the first time, if he didn't see her as he approached, if, you know, if he had admitted any which way that he saw her as he approached and didn't decide to cross the street then, then I'm fully on board with what you're saying. But I can't I, I can't uphold something where I don't know for sure what the guy, you know, that he obviously if he's sitting there letting the dog men be menacing in front of her house because he's trying to scare her. That's terrible. I don't see anywhere in the statute where intent is required. Well, I understand that. But once again, I don't believe that one incident when he's walking by not knowing she was there where the dog is jumping up and barking at her is is going on. I mean, we, we upheld a, a running at large last time because kids let go of a leash essentially right no i remember the i mean and i'm not so what i'm saying is i don't believe that we, we i understand the intent's not there but what my point is if this was something that was continuous 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 i don't believe that it is and i believe that it was just uh, i walked by i didn't see her there i figured i could walk right by no big deal and it became a deal one time well this is i mean twice now that that these folks have had interactions like this how many times does she need to come back and report it before it becomes a pattern. I mean, whether or not he yeah. saw her, I, like I said, the intent is, I, I'm not seeing it required anywhere. Um, I'm just seeing, you know, that her right as a citizen to stand in her driveway without being terrified was interfered with. Um, and this is twice now she's come looking for help. And I feel like we're doing a disservice if we just say, oh, well, he didn't see her, he didn't have the intent. Cause I, I, that's, you know, I, you know, he can go home tonight and walk, um, the dog back in front of the house to me that is just deliberately harassing i mean i would say after a day in court like this today if he wandered back and forth in front of her house yeah i would say that if she could point that out as evidence that would be harassing and that would be you know that maybe be further you know that legal outside of animal control i just i personally intent or no intent you know i i don't see where if he you know, he has the right to be there. That's all I can say. He has the right to be there. It's a bad decision necessarily maybe to be there if you avoid someplace the rest of your life because of this incident. I mean, it is what it is. But she does. She has to look out her window and see if he's out there and then avoid the front, the street right in front of her house. If she's but there. if he has the dog under control, he sh she shouldn't have to avoid that. She should be able to go out and do what she has to do. Well, you, but she chooses not to. It only takes one time. Well, and I don't know if I was in her position that I'd want to risk the one time then the dog got out of his control if the dog is that agitated seeing her but i, I don't think we're going to come to an agreement on this so i don't mind being the one dissenting voice what i'm hearing is i, I don't i i totally get it like i said i wanted to open some discussion i i just i, I don't i don't i don't know if anyone else has anything to say this doesn't need to be back and forth between me and you jennifer well the only comment i have is um i agree there's no intent needed here but the bottom line is what I'm looking at is the totality. I was not on the commission when we had the June 7th hearing, but obviously something happened uh, that caused these two parties to come together before the commission. Um, regardless of the outcome, I think that speaks volumes in terms of a history that's developing here, Tom. That's where I'm coming from um, it, as but... far as the as far as the animal nuisance goes, um, you know, that that uh, I, I have a tough time with the animal disturbance. But the nuisance, I think, is a re is reasonable because I believe, from what I've heard from testimony and the executive summary of what happened on the sixth um, June of 2020 commission hearing, that we are starting to develop a history here, and okay. that's where I agree with Jennifer that I'm getting concerned that you know how many times are we going to go through this back and forth before we have a serious outcome, and now we're dealing with a dangerous dog or a potentially dangerous dog scenario. So let me, that's, let, those are, let me, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, that's, those were my thoughts. I apologize, Tom. Well, let me just pose another scenario then. Okay. So if we uphold this, this nuisance and she see, she's out in front of her house with her dog and he walks on the other side of the street and his dog acts the same exact way. 
and she writes another citation because the dog is now across the street. So then, then what are they supposed to do as far as walking their dog? I mean, I guess my point is he's six feet away. He's on public property on her side of the street. I get it. Bad idea. But if the same thing's occurring on the other side of the street, are we saying that that's, that should be upheld as animal nuisance as well? That's not what I, that's a good point, Tom. That's a good point. I mean, I, I personally can't really argue that because really all we've done is separate those people by 30 feet and we still have the same problem. That's what I'm saying. Jennifer, but back to Jennifer's point, he has every right to be there, but then Ms. Uh, Smilowitz has every right, every right to the peaceful enjoyment of her property. Just like we deal with with bark. This seems I'm like reducing this to a barking case in my mind, as far as okay. what we feel is reasonable. As far as if we if we start making a precedent that you know when someone walks by a house in this situation. And their dog starts barking at someone who's there. If they get scared that they can write a citation, even though the person, the dog was fully under control, maybe acting out, but under control. And that's where I don't, that's where I'm having a hard time with this. I don't want to, that, that, and that's why I'm going to have this discussion. We don't, you, you know me guys. I mean, Dr. I actually, you haven't been here for a while. we haven't had a long discussion like this yeah, in, a case in a long time. So I'm happy to do it, but. Yeah. I that's actually point, agree Tom. with the scenario you just raised, Tom. And if this were like our first impression of this, I would be inclined to agree with you. And obviously we can't set as a commission, like, you know, a distance, this isn't a restraining order or anything. I just, um, it bothers me that this, that there was an affirmative step taken um, by the defendant to come closer to her home when he was already on the other side of the street and could have stayed there. Um, and I just don't, I, you know, like I said, I, I don't want to have to wait you know, or set a standard where, okay, you got to do this three times or four times before it's an issue. We're here twice. I, to me, that should be enough. And I hear the history and I don't want to see anything further happen, but at the same time, the, the more we rule against, if we rule against this animal in this situation now, then what's to stop it from coming back? And, and again, and again, now I was walking down the street and I crossed over the house before, but I got scared. So I tripped and fell up the steps. I mean, those are the things that we have to think about moving forward too. So anyhow, I'm fine with that. Does anybody else have any other input? I don't want to monopolize this, this discussion. Yeah, I I, uh, uh, I see it uh, from a. We need to look at it at a uh, through a reasonable person's uh, view. Um, and I'm hearing the defense. Uh, I hear the complainant, and and I don't uh, I don't dismiss that. I respect that. I hear the defendant though, and I see the pictures. Uh, there is a curve. There is a curve there. Uh, both of them uh, agreed that there is a curve, and if cars were there was no uh, uh, there was no argument that there were cars parked there that day, uh, the day of the incident, and if cars were parked there, uh, it it could also be a little distracting. So I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, you know, do, does he have the right to to walk his dog? Yes, of course, he has the right to walk the dog. Um, but I'm also looking at it that, you know, it, it could have been that he, you know, going around that corner, you know, and, and once once he, he saw her, he did uh, keep the dog under control. He did speak to it softly. So I think he was aware that uh, something could happen and he was taking reasonable steps to keep anything more from happening so that's why and that was not disputed so that that's why me i have a hard time supporting either one of the citations because it it, it just seems reasonable for him to be walking this dog and he was going around that corner uh, around the curve, cars were parked there, and when the dog did start acting out, he did acknowledge it. He said, stop, quiet, stop, quiet. That was even in the letter of complaint, um, and he, he tightened up on the leash because the, the paws were going up. So he, he, he didn't ignore it totally. If he had us just kept on walking or something, you know, nonchalant, it probably would have uh, stuck a little more in my head. But um, as I see it, uh, like I said, I, I think uh, by a reasonable person's standard, he acknowledged uh, that there was uh, potential and he took 
he took reasonable steps to keep anything further from happening. So uh, that that's kind of that's just my view on it. So um, anybody else, please uh, chime in, Matthew. I'm I'm largely in front of you and Tom's court. Like I can see the entire situation of walking down the street, not seeing Miss Millerits getting to the end of the street crossing and then doubling back to come back to your house and still not seeing her as you come around that corner. And the neighbor warns her that here comes Sleepy. So they move up the driveway and then he gets to the end of the driveway and there she is. So he stops, tries to calm Sleepy down and then proceeds on. I just don't see evidence that he pointedly caused the interaction. Like if, if I, that would be terribly, that would be a terrible situation, but I don't see definite evidence that clear intent that that's what happened. Good points. Very good points. Corporal, you have anything else? Um, no, I'm, I'm still on the same thing. Um, I, I just think about we're, we're looking at one incident that occurred. This was an ongoing incident that, you know, constant complaint, but she filled it out for one date, one time. And like Mr. Burgess said, if, if we go one way or the other, it's like that sets a precedent, then everybody would start kind of saying the same thing. Um, I believe if I look at it in the, 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 at the, the law, how things are, she's allowed to walk on the sidewalk. Um, he comes around a corner, the lady's there. Okay. All right. He corrects his dog, which is probably what he was taught to do when he went to training, right? You have to stop, correct the dog, and then he continued on. Um, he wasn't standing out in front of her house. There was no argument or anything like that ensued. So I find it hard to uphold that, you know, that this was an intent or something like that. I feel it was just, uh, circumstance that shouldn't have happened because he walked on the other side of the street yes but then we start getting back and forth with that he walked down the road he came around the corner fixed the situation continued on yeah i'm gonna make one last comment and then i'm gonna leave it alone and let you guys vote um i just want to point out that under the definition of public nuisance it says an act singular it does not require a pattern or multiple instances Yeah. One one other thing that I that I did find I I found that uh, the parties in this case were pretty reasonable. Their behavior was was very civil, um, and I, I honestly believe that uh, this will not be forgotten. Either way it goes here, whatever the outcome is, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, the vices are on notice that. Uh, uh, the complainant uh, is uh, a little sensitive to to the the uh, aggressiveness of the dog. So, uh, do I hear a proposed motion? Yeah, well, anybody? I'll, I'll go ahead and move that we dismiss both both citations. That's that's where I feel right now. Can we do them individually? Um, uh, if you want to, that's fine. You know, spoiler alert here. I'm obviously going to dissent from the nuisance one, but um, I don't have a problem with the disturbance being dismissed. That's fine. So I'll, I'll move first that we, just, that, that we dismiss the animal disturbance prohibited. Uh, I don't know what the number is on there. I don't have it up here in front of me. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. We'll get it. I'm having technical difficulties today. Have you guys noticed I was a little late getting in, so I don't want to lose my screen here, and then, I'm, then you guys won't get anything from me. Great. That's Three Z four six six one six two zero nine. Two zero nine. Okay, so for animal disturbance prohibited, I'll move that we that we uphold. I'm sorry that we dismiss animal disturbance prohibited ending in uh, two oh nine. Do I hear a second? Second that. All in favor? Aye. Okay, and then again, I'll move. Uh, I'm going to move to dismiss also the animal public nuisance, which I'm guessing is ending in 210. Is that right? 6210. Yeah. I'll second. It's been seconded. All in favor? Motion carries. All right. All right. <clears throat> with, with that uh, being finished. Um, Philip, I believe we have the uh, second situation here where we need to discuss as a commission 
the uh, proposed legislation that was uh, sent to us uh, or sent to me rather to uh, share with you all and uh, get comments on and then there was some discussion about uh, having it just in email form uh, it did not uh, comport to the uh, open meeting uh, rules and regulations so uh, we need to discuss it in this form I believe uh, and uh, did everybody have a get a copy of it and have a chance to review it yes yeah I have okay I I also want to I'm not gonna I'm not I'm not gonna uh, speak on this first or at, at any length I just want to tell you I did send a letter uh, I think you all saw copies of that or got copies of that. Uh, I did make a mistake in that letter and I uh, used the, <laughs> I used for whatever reason, I used the wrong uh, title of what we are. We are the, the uh, Animal Matters Commission, not the Animal Care and Control. I spent too much time online looking at the, uh, at the adoptions and trying to help out. And, and that, that title just stuck in my head. So, uh, uh, I did correct that, and with that, I just want to hear comments from the rest of you all. Um, Ed, would it make sense? I know, Jennifer, you responded to the original email, and I did as well. I don't know if anyone else did. I can't remember, but would it make, since now we're in the public forum, would it make sense to kind of at least discuss what we had already put in email form? Would that make sense to start? Absolutely. I've not gotten any emails. I guess maybe I'm just too new to the to the group. Phil, okay. was I in that loop? I believe that particular I looking in the wrong spot? before you were added to the commission. Um, okay. I can get a copy of it forwarded to you. No, no, no need. I'm sure they'll bring me up to speed as we go through the discussion. No need to waste your time doing that. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Uh, just to bring everybody up to speed, um, I'm just going to say uh, there was a, a case that we heard um, a while ago, I forget the exact date. It was the Odin and Lucy case um, that got a lot of attention um, after we heard it. Uh, it was a vicious order and um, just uh, a Reader's Digest condensed version of it. It, uh, it, it kind of got out of hand. The two dogs, Odin and Lucy, were facing euthanasia and um, uh, perhaps wrongfully so depending on how you look at the case. Um, I agree that uh, that that should not have been the end result. And uh, I'm going to save my comments uh, afterwards. I made enough comments. Now I want to hear from the rest of uh, the commission. Well, I'll go ahead. I, I sent an email. I read this last week and I sent an email. Obviously, that that wasn't appropriate, you know, as far as the Open Meetings Act. So the one that um you know reading through this the biggest thing that jumped out to me was you know they're calling for the words are specifically where is it uh for um evidence to be um to be determined by uh, i'm sorry where am i oh god basically that we have to have either digital physical either witness eye, eyewitness accounts or digital evidence presented to uphold a vicious order that's that's the the major change um and that was kind of the big thing obviously jumped out to me and going back in time and thinking about other cases we've had um and then since reading ed's letter um the big thing was i, I feel like one of the early vicious cases that we saw we had a situation where an unattended dog got into the yard of another unattended dog, killed that animal, was still in the other animal's yard, and that's how the animal was discovered. So in that situation, we, there was no digital evidence. There was no, you know, there was no eyewitness to it. The animal obviously killed the other animal. I mean, it was pretty obvious. I don't think anybody disputed it in court. I mean, I think oh, there was there may be other evidence in that. It, it's been a while, but it would take away from that. And then Ed points out in his letter, a situation where, you know, I'm jogging at Downs Park, let's say, or any community park that's near a neighborhood. And I'm jogging alone. And out of nowhere, a dog comes running out of the woods or wherever and bites me and attacks me. And if I don't have digital evidence of this happening, or, um, you know, if, if there was not, no happened to be cameras around, um, then, then what happens? So that, that's my major concern with the, with the changes here. Um, I do believe that 
you know, there should be another way, as also to Ed's, Ed's, some of Ed's statements in his letter. I think giving us more tools as a commission, not just, you know, euthanasia being the final end result, I think that that can be an end result. Um, I think, you know, implementing maybe having veterinaries, veterinarians or someone look into it, finding other options for these animals, maybe rescues that, that are trained to deal with these type of animals, anything we can do. Um, but I think giving us more options in general, we can discuss those options at, at length here, but um, I think, you know, hamstringing us with basically the dangerous and the potentially dangerous, which essentially come down to the difference in a cost of uh, a license, um, not with no real major differences. I think there's plenty of times on this commission when we all wish we had another method we could implore, um, mandatory training that could be followed up on somehow. And I know that creates work for animal control in the long run sometimes, and that can be a, a problem too. But um, that's kind of, that was my concern with, with the change as, as it was. I think, you know, including those things is important, including having digital evidence and all that stuff. Um, and maybe, Ms. Brianza, since you have the legal background, you can discuss more specifically the difference between the, um, the levels of uh, evidence that need to be brought. The, the, was the, the um, beyond reasonable well, can, doubt versus what's the other one? Right. Um, well, I'll tell you the way I tell my mock trials convincing. students. Yeah. Um, I'm a mock trial coach for a local high school, but the easiest way to remember it is like right now we do um, preponderance of the evidence. And that's basically just more likely than not. You just kind of got to tip the scales just a little bit to get okay. to preponderance of the evidence. Um, whereas I think most people are familiar with beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's, you know, 99.9%, .9%, you know, you don't have any questions. You're pretty sure it happened. Um, clear and convincing, the way I explain it to my students is um, that's at about the 75% mark. You know, it's, you're not quite to um, that certainty that you are with reasonable doubt, but there's, but you've met a much higher burden um then you would have under preponderance of the evidence and i guess you know i when we're talking about the kind of um the impacts that dangerous uh that potentially dangerous and dangerous orders have um i it's just my personal opinion i don't know um how the rest of you feel but i, I, I was glad to see the, um a suggestion that that be raised to a clear and convincing standard i went back as the lucent the um, Odin and Lucy case progressed in the courts and became, you know, um, written up more in the public. I went back and rewatched that hearing that we did. And that was my very first hearing as a commissioner. Um, that was a, kind of like a big one to cut my teeth on. But I made a comment during that hearing that I was really uncomfortable with the fact that we were proceeding without eyewitness testimony. I did not, you know, we, there was an affidavit, but the, the gentleman, the complainant didn't show up and that bothered me. Um, that bothered me greatly. So um, I'm definitely, and I, and I don't think had we had these standards in place, I don't know, you know, everyone has their own opinion, but it would not have met um, a clear, it, it would not, definitely wouldn't have met a reasonable doubt standard to me, but, and it, but it would not have met a clear and convincing standard. Um, I had not too closely considered the, the evidence designation until Tom raised it. Um, and I kind of, I'm in agreement with him. Number one, I think the scenario in Ed's um, letter is, I mean, it would not apply to this because it says testimony or authenticated digital evidence. So it's not a combination. It, it's, it's an either or. And in his case, the jogger himself can testify. Um, he is the eyewitness. Um, I mean, obviously, I suppose, unless that person was rendered incapable. But regardless, I'm trying to think, um, and maybe um, Ms. Troxell is better because I'm not a criminal attorney, I'm a civil litigator. I'm trying to think of any other case where we would dictate the type of evidence required. Um, because it is, I mean, we secure criminal convictions all the time based on circumstantial evidence. So there can be plenty of other things that point to the conclusion besides eyewitness testimony and digital evidence. And I don't think we do it in any other case that would involve a human. So I'm not sure how that would be fair to do that um, to, I to a dog. May I, may I please ask a point of personal education, if you don't mind? Can you explain to me the levels in terms of accuracy that we start from? Is it reasonable doubt, clear and convincing? We start with what, What's the hierarchy? Uh, well, it, it's different from civil to criminal. In um, almost all civil cases, it's preponderance of the evidence. You know, that's like your average car accident case or 
contract case or things of that nature. There are certain cases of statutory construction that our legislature has decided need a little bit more evidence than the general civil standard, but not quite as much as um, a criminal. And that's and those are by statute designated as cases um, where clear and convincing evidence is required. It used to be required in um, domestic violence cases, but Maryland changed that. Um, you know, to me, clear and convincing is just sort of a it, it's a way to split the baby. Like I said, it, it's a okay. you know. Where you're a little bit more than um, just barely tipping the scales, but you're not 100% convinced. And in a lot of these, I think that's completely appropriate in animal control cases because, like what we just saw um, in the case before us, you know, it you kind of get a sense for what happened, but you're not you don't really know for um, for sure. Um, and I think when with something that has the kind of impact as a dangerous order, a potentially dangerous order, I'm you know I, I have no problem thinking we need to step that up a little bit. And had that been in place at the time we did the Lucy and Ogan case, I don't think that that would have turned out um, the way it had. But um, I do, and I thank Tom for pointing it out. I, I do have an issue with um, with evidence being dictated because I don't see, I, I don't know of any other case where that's you know where where we are where any trier of fact is restrained by that. Okay. I'd like to just state that I also uh, indirectly, directly followed the Odin and Lucy case, uh, albeit uh, not, not really wanting to, but I did hear a lot uh, about it from a mutual friend of the uh, uh, defend, defending parties, um, I don't, I'm not going to mention any names here, but once it was appealed, um, and that's what confused me, and that's what I wrote. In the, once the, the complainant uh, failed to show, uh, I'm looking at the letter here that was just sent to the, uh, to the well, it was sent to the, the complainant uh, today. It says, please be aware, now that you have filed, uh, you are now our witness for any prosecution of the citation. The defendant has a right to appeal any citations issued to the uh, blah, blah, blah. Cut into the chase. Uh, if you do not appear, the claim and the citations associated will be dismissed. So this is the letter that, that, that is sent out. And I don't know why that was, up, was not upheld in the appeals. Uh, okay. Robin seems to know. Can she answer that up? Go ahead, Robin. Okay, so first, we, um, there are different types of cases, um, and, and Office of Law, I'm sure, could weigh in on this as well. The case that you heard today was an affidavit case. They filed the complaint, Animal Care and Control issued the citation using their affidavit as probable cause. In the Lucy and Odin case, that case was investigated by Animal Care and Control. The witness statement, et cetera, was provided to animal care and control. Animal care and control was your complainant in that case. We were the ones that issued the order. So that's that's the difference. The animal care and control officer was there at the hearing and testified to what information they gathered in their process. Okay. Um, and while I have you all's attention, um, there are a couple of things that I wanted to say, um, not necessarily about the legislation at this point, but I wanted you all to be aware that there is a parent um, who's on this call and, and watching, and if you all are willing to let her be promoted um, up to panelists, um, she is the parent of a child whose dog was attacked and killed in front of her. Um, just before we heard the Lucy and Odin case last year, well, the incident occurred during the Lucy and Odin case, but before you all heard it, um, and um, it's something that um, impacted animal care and controls um, decision to uphold the or to place a vicious order and then our recommendation um, and the chief's recommendation for continuing to maintain the, the vicious order. Um, and I also have the parents permission to show you all the blurred out um, ring footage of the incident that occurred. Thankfully, this case did not go before um, you all. 
um, because the owners of the dog made the correct decision at that point. But if it's rare that we have ring footage, it's rare that we have video footage. Many of you have been on this commission for quite a while and you know how often it is that we're, I hate to say lucky enough to have video footage of something. But in this particular case, had we not had video footage and this draft of legislation been in effect, we would have been requiring that an 11 year old child come and relive that situation. Um, and I really think um, before you all give your opinions um, on the legislation, I think it would be very beneficial for you to watch and hear um, this video. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm all in favor. <laughs> okay. Um, let me set up so that I can share screen. Robin, with the share screen pop up, there should be a little check mark down at the bottom to enable system audio. I know that thing likes to hang us up sometimes. Yes, it sure does. Just opening it up. All right, where's the optimized share sound? Got it. Share. And okay. it's popping now. Can everybody see it? Yep. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And I apologize that this is disturbing to watch. it there um but again it is incredibly rare that we are and i hate to say the word lucky in this particular case lucky enough to have that type of footage no adults witnessed this it was an 11 year old child that watched her dog killed in seconds before her and this happened 331 if you all saw the date on there the commission hearing for the lucy and odin case was in april just a few days later so that's what animal care and control, our job is to protect from that. Um, and again, the mother of this child is on the, on the Zoom call if you'd like to hear from her. Absolutely. Um, do we, uh, all in favor? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Uh, yeah, I'm fine with that too. I, I, I do have one question here. Uh, comment on um what's expected of the commission with this is the uh county executive expecting us to just comment on this uh, before it's presented to the council or what what is the county executive looking for whatever the result is what what, what are we trying to do with this or are we just commenting on it or are we just what are we doing from from what i understand i was sent uh an email uh, that it kind of surprised me, but uh, from a doctor, uh, uh, Dr. Kai Bogus de Bruin, she is uh, from the Office of the County Executive Chief of Staff. And um, she sent a copy of the proposed legislation and um, she wants our input. There was also uh, another organization of, uh, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Robin, I believe it was. Uh, the uh, veterinarians, uh, a veterinarian organization. The Animal Welfare Council was also sent the legislation and asked to provide their feedback. Okay. And that, that's basically the same thing uh, that we're uh, asked to, is to just to provide the, the, the feedback here. Uh, okay. I uh, understand. And, and Thank you. In, in, a, in a public forum, like this so that we meet the requirements of the uh, the open discussions uh, transparency. So with that, um, I believe we'll hear from uh, Maureen Porto. 
Yes, how are you? Um, thank you to the commission for letting me speak. Um, I am coming into this a little late. I just got a call from Robin about an hour ago um, asking for permission to share that blurred video. Um, and, you know, just trying to catch up on the proposed legislation now. As a citizen in Anne Arundel County, it is um, disturbing and concerning, certainly, that um, there would be legislation um, that would make it harder to protect public safety. Um, it seems obvious that the entire um, intention behind animal control is public safety. Um, it's, it's hard to watch that video. Um, you know, we just had the one year anniversary um, of that whole experience. It was um, extremely unlucky that it happened on the front steps of our house because that is a place that my daughter should have felt safe from this animal. Um, you know, but we were lucky, quote unquote, that it was caught on a ring tape um, for a number of reasons, because it was a cut and dry um, situation. We were able to identify the dog quickly because this was not an animal that lived in our neighborhood. It was visiting this neighborhood. Um, we were lucky that it was on video because we were able to get a physical description and start to track that animal um, who was, it was a three hour pursuit to catch that animal. That animal had um, blood all over it. It was a very, very vicious attack and um, was absolutely um, energized by that. It, it was a three hour, I, I think, believe there were probably three different um, animal control officers who ended up responding as time went on because it was such a public safety threat with other you know animals being walked uh, that morning and this dog on the loose and crazy. Um, we are lucky that this video existed because the owners of that dog, their knee jerk immediate reaction was, why didn't you have your dog? Why was your dog in the way of my dog? And that was their initial response was, what do you mean our dog attacked your dog? What was your dog doing? You know, and if there hadn't been a video, their dog could have skated again. Their dog, um, I don't know if, uh, well, I get this is very relevant. The dog, that attacking dog had a long history and, and was still walking through my neighborhood. That dog had had a, um, a potential rabies exposure in Fairfax County, Virginia the owners of that dog were notified of the potential rabies exposure because that dog was found after attacking a, ra um, a raccoon and rather than having their dog go through the um you know prophylactic treatments for potential rabies exposure they they chose to quarantine the dog for 30 days they then made a, a move to Anne Arundel County to stay with neighbors of ours for several weeks while waiting for a new home in Virginia to become available. They petitioned Fairfax County to petition Anne Arundel County's health department and animal control to pass the order of that uh, required quarantine from Fairfax County to Anne Arundel County. Anne Arundel County Animal Control did everything they should have in following those protocols and visited the home to make sure that the house was, you know, had a fenced in yard for this animal that was supposed to be on a quarantine. They uh, had the homeowners re-sign paperwork saying that that dog would not be in the neighborhood, would not leave the property, would not be under the care of more than one assigned adult. Um, the owners of that dog flubbed their nose at all of it within hours of animal control leaving the home. They were walking this animal up and down our street. I have that animal being walked half dozen, a dozen times by luck on my ring camera. Um, it was interacting after this rabies exposure and, and mandatory quarantine. It was interacting with every other dog in our neighborhood. Owners said we warned them that that dog was vicious. That dog was out of the owner's control, but there was little that could be done to protect public safety. And quite honestly, if that dog hadn't slaughtered my daughter's dog on the front steps of our house, that dog would have attacked. I mean, the public safety risk was so egregious 
And the thought of passing legislation that makes it more difficult for animal control officers to protect public safety is absolutely, I, I don't even have the words to, to express how disheartening and how frightening and concerning that is to hear as, as a member of the public. Because even with the systems in place, to protect public safety after that potential rabies exposure and this dog showing signs of being aggressive and vicious, there wasn't enough that could be done to, to protect, you know, the, the dogs, domesticated animals and the people of my community. I can't imagine if it had been more difficult and, and the, the definition of vicious was moved to beyond a reasonable doubt. This isn't, this isn't a criminal human case. These aren't, you know, that's not the legislation that we're discussing today. It seems it seems asinine to me that that there could be legislation that would push it to make it even harder for animal control to do this. You know, looking at that video is is disgusting and it's frightening and thinking back to the events of that day. I am so lucky that that dog didn't turn around and attack my daughter when she chased after to get her her dog back. I mean, her dead dog. That was that was a vicious, bloody scene. I mean, that video sh shuts off. It was horrific, horrific. Um, she was, she is traumatized. It the thought of having her then go into court to have to testify, you know, is is frightening. But that was a very possible outcome. As I said, the owners of that dog, if that video didn't exist and it wasn't as black and white and they didn't see it they were never going to give up the dog who had attacked our dog. They weren't. When they were notified that their dog had attacked, their, their absolute impulse was to say, well, what did your dog do? I mean, could you imagine if this video didn't exist? They would have said, oh, that was a smaller dog. It was probably, it, there would have, it would have been a battle for public safety at that point. And, you know, yes, I, guess, I suppose we're one of the lucky ones that the, happens to be in, in eyesight of a ring, you know, video, but that doesn't always happen. A lot of these encounters are at dog parks or outside of the eye of, of surveillance, but it, it's just, it's just very, 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 very concerning to imagine what that would have looked like to have to bring her back into court after all of the trauma that she was already exposed to, to have to have her relive it all over again in court you know, would have been something that she probably would have pushed herself to do. But but that would have been, I, I think that puts a tremendous amount of, of, you know, uh, trauma on those who are already traumatized. And I can tell you that those owners never would have released their dog to animal control to be euthanized if this video didn't exist. And Clearly that dog was vicious. It was not provoked. It, it was on the hunt. There were three other neighbors of ours who came forward and contacted us after the attack with their ring videos to show us that that dog had been at large for a significant amount of time and was snooping at their, sniffing at their front doors, looking for their small animals. That dog was on the hunt, ready to kill, as you can see from that video where it rounds the corner, leaps over my daughter and attacks our dog and unprovoked. And the thought of that dog being released back to the custody of its owners who were completely unconcerned about public safety, it wasn't a concern to them. They never even followed the quarantine. They, their, their immediate response upon hearing about the attack was, well, what did your dog do? Why, why did, you know, probably deserved it. It was literally what they said. It was the thought of that being a battle and the thought of animal control having to work even harder for public safety is, is backwards. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, you so much, Maureen. Yes. Thank you. And yes. Thank you for, for working hard to, to protect the public. We appreciate it. And thank you for everything that animal control did in, in the days and weeks following, there was a lot of compassion and a lot of, care and, and we appreciate the response all of my neighbors do uh, you know the, the number of animal control officers that came out to finally you know catch that dog and, and keep the public safe was greatly greatly appreciated so thank you
Thank, Thank you. I'm, I'm so sorry this happened. And again, please, please tell your daughter we're all thinking about her all the time still. No, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Um, I'm going to continue on my line of thought, uh, and it's just a, a little bit. Um, th that was horrific. Um, geez, I, I, I can't. You you can't unsee that. You just you just can't. Um. Oh yeah, Robin, you you explained uh, why uh, the judge uh, in the appeals uh, didn't dismiss it because of uh, the uh, complainant's lack of participation or showing. Um, but even so, uh, I I do have to question then why uh, a judge in the matter uh, wouldn't dismiss it for you know. Uh, the Odin and Lucy case I'm talking about, uh, why a judge wouldn't have dismissed it for lack of uh, supporting evidence. Uh, you know, that's why we have the, uh, the appeals process. So uh, just so you understand, this went in front of <clears throat> Lucy and Odin went to the Board of Appeals first. Um, and the Board of Appeals is a, it is a very infor uh, informal administrative type proceeding similar to ours. Um, where you know they're they're not you know they're not tied as closely to the rule of law as, as we are so i could see you know to me the chain how this wove its way through the court system makes perfect sense to me i can see um the board of appeals upholding it and it makes perfect sense that when it got in front of a judge it was um remanded because i mean generally what you're saying you know the court would look for something more substantial however just so you know and 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 i'm not a criminal prosecutor um and miss troxell can please correct me if i'm overstepping here but you know in a lot of criminal just general criminal cases among humans um you know it is the state prosecuting just like it was animal control prosecuting um and the state you know the prosecutor has to make the determination whether or not they can go forward with a case when they don't have the eyewitness testimony or the victim's testimony sometimes they can, um, and they can still make the case based on circumstantial evidence if they don't have what they need. You know, in a murder case, you know, the victim's never going to testify. Um, you know, sometimes they can't, and they choose to dismiss it or place it on the set docket or do a variety, you know, null process, do a variety of, of other things which are not at our disposal as um, at a commission. So it's it's generally it's not unheard of. But the next step in this appeals process is was very similar to ours. So I could see how it got past the board of appeals. Okay, and here's, I've been through the entire process. Um, um, I had a, uh, I don't know if any, any uh, commission member uh, was, was around on the commission at the time. Robin may remember, I think maybe uh, Tom may, might remember, but I had an incident here where I had to file on my neighbor uh, for some sheep. Um, that uh, came or that were running at large. They were causing traffic problems and and uh, tearing up people's uh, uh, shrubs and all kind of things like that. But uh, anyway, we, we it was appealed all the way to the very end, and we went before a judge. And um, in going through that, I, I just can't. As a matter of fact, when it was remanded, I can't understand why. I mean, that's, that's why we have the checks and balances of appeals in, in place. Um, and I just think that, okay, we as a commission and forever and ever, this is, this is what, and I reviewed all the past cases uh, in order to get this uh, speech that is given before uh, we commence. Um, and it says, um, uh, let's see here. Um, oh yeah. Uh, these are administrative hearings and by their nature, they are informal, which means you are not hampered by rules of evidence. So with this proposed legislation, that's out the window. I no. mean, that no, 
because that's you're confusing two different things, Ed. Right now, even when you say that speech and you say we're not hampered by the rules of evidence, you're not saying we're not hampered by the statute. There's a difference between the statutes we have to enforce and the rules of evidence. Statutes are what the legislature you know, passes saying it's illegal to do this, it's not illegal to do that. The rules of evidence are how you, um, are, are how the evidence is received by the trier of fact. For example, in a real court, you wouldn't be able to say, oh, well, so-and-so said, because that's hearsay. Correct. Okay. That's, that's what but, I'm talking about. Yeah, well, but- That's what comes before us. Right, but that, this is not, um, the oh, well, with the exception when you change the standard of evidence, you're not necessarily, when, when you change it in the statute like this, okay, you're not changing the, the rules of evidence that you're referring to in that speech. Like they don't have, when somebody, like when they present a document, okay, like letters, they don't have to, they're not necessarily authenticating it, you know, not, not through the normal procedures that we would in a courtroom. So what I'm understanding real quick, Jennifer, is so th th what you're talking about is animal control has to follow these statutes to be able to formulate a case to then present it to us. And in which case the people don't have to, it's not the same level. You know, it still goes back to the, um, like what Ed was just saying with the, uh, it's not, you know, it's informal. Okay. How the evidence is presented is informal. Right. Okay. But the bottom line, the, the standard by which you know, we're supposed to make these, um, that we shift through. Yes. Right. The standard so that we apply at the end of the day is not informal, but it, it, right. it has always been in place. Right. I mean, that, for every hearing since the beginning of this commission, you've been right. applying a standard. That essentially is, is, is what I was, uh, trying to, to say. In other words, as they present this, uh, we, we, you know, we, we entertain what could possibly be objected to as hearsay, and we entertain uh, uh, other things that uh, are flimsy uh, evidence. And uh, I mean, we went, we went on, uh, I mean, we've heard so many cases where uh, we've heard uh, things uh, be reduced down to name calling and things like that. That's what I'm saying. We take all this in and it's up to us to sift through it. However, uh, if this proposed legislation is adopted, it wouldn't even get to us. Then it, 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 it just wouldn't get to us. In other words, in order to even file a complaint, it would have to be with digital. If the digital wasn't there, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. If, if we didn't have a, an eyewitness, uh, it wouldn't get there. It would be sorry. Uh, and the only thing we'd be reduced uh, to hearing, uh, like I said in my letter, we'd be here uh, with, with dog barking issues and, and warning letters. And that's about it, because I don't think anybody could, could meet the requirements of uh, the standard of evidence as proposed um, in order to, to get a uh, dangerous, potentially dangerous or even vicious order. Um, and, and like we just saw, that was, that was, uh, luck. It just happened to be right in front of a ring camera. And I also stated in my letter, and, and I think, uh, Tom reiterated it is that, um, it, you know, most of the cases that we have seen, and I did review them before I wrote the letter, uh, uh we've, we've had bicyclists. We've had joggers, we've had uh, a guy, you know, offloading his boat, a guy working in his garage and things of this nature, that your first instinct is not going to be to grab your phone and, and um, get some digital recording of what's happening to you. Your initial response is to protect yourself. Um, in the case we saw today, I doubt very seriously if... Uh, Sleepy had a gotten away from its owner and went after her. She's not gonna. She's not gonna pull for her cell phone and start filming him. And she wouldn't have had an eyewitness. So where would that have left her? Um, this is the problem that I had. Now I will say initially, uh, the Odin and Lucy case upset me as it progressed, and I was uh, I was initially happy to to see the proposed language because 
I thought it was only going to be for vicious cases. And we do need uh, we do need some some changes where it comes to vicious. But I think it needs to be centered on the uh, euthanasia part of that final sentence, and and not the fact that the dog could not be vicious, because clearly. In the in the video, the ring video that we just saw, the dog the dog was vicious. Uh, the owners are not going to say it was. They might even be able to get a couple neighbors to say that it's not uh, vicious, that it's very friendly, and things like that. And and um, after after I I took a step back and, and I went online and I reviewed the past cases, um, it made me very very apprehensive. Uh, about this proposed language. Uh, uh, it would render us as a commission, I think, useless. It would tie our hands and the people that would come forward, um, they would have an extra burden of, of proof that uh, is, is just unreasonable for them to uh, go forward with. And, um, you know, if our hands are tied, I have to dismiss everything. So, uh, uh, and I was just uh, trying to clarify, I, 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 I couldn't help but think that we have the checks and balances of the first appeal and then a third appeal. Um, I mean, uh, the two appeals from the commission's decision um, that should have acted as a safety net uh, in the Odin and Lucy case. And just Can I ask a question real quick with the Odin and Lucy case? Because I'm pretty sure I know the answer. I just want to make sure that I, I'm understanding this correct. We heard that case, correct? We, we came in front of us, and we actually recommended to reduce, didn't we? Yes, we did. Okay, so then the chief of police decided to not take our recommendation in this case as well, which I think plays a little bit into this as well, too, is, you know, not, it's nothing we can do about it. Obviously, the police chief's going to decide what, you know, based on animal controls evidence and everything as well. But, um, again, I think that points to us as – as far as commenting on this legislation is what can we add to this legislation other than evidentiary and all that type of stuff to give us more options to send to the police chief to give, you know, I think that we can, you know, make some suggestions that way can, could be helpful too, because I was confused when I first heard about this, people started sending me, you know, messages. To me, Have you know anything about this? Were you involved in this? And I was, I couldn't think of it because I was like, I feel like we were, but I, I don't remember upholding the vicious. So that's why it didn't click with me. So anyhow. I just want to make sure that I was right with that. Thank you. Rob. Sorry, I think I might be cutting in front of Dr. Hammer, but yes, to clarify for you, Tom, you all as a commission had recommended that the orders be reduced to extremely stringent, dangerous orders requiring that the owners had a stockade or bull privacy fence um, for the animals. And at the commission hearing, the owner had advised that his landlord would not allow him to do that. Um, and you all had also talked about extending the timeframes for him to get in compliance. And again, upon considering the video that we all just saw of another case and trying to uphold public safety and hearing that the owner had said that they would not be able to comply with a stringent order, um, the chief ultimately decided to re, uh, well, not reimpose because it was never gone, um, to not follow your recommendation, but to leave the vicious in place in efforts to protect public safety. Well, can um, I ask you another quick question? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'll absolutely take your question. Something that you all may not know is, so what ultimately happened? I don't know, I know some of you have followed the case uh, online and ultimately, as um, Jennifer said, they... Um, once it got to circuit court, which, so you guys know how long that took um, before these dogs were ultimately um, reclaimed by the owner at the end of the case. They were both here for 384 days um, because it took a very, very long time for it to get to circuit court. And one of um, the suggestions that I have made is that the process needs to be cleaned up in how we expedite these cases. Um, because ultimately the circuit court's decision pushed it back or mandated it to Board of Appeals, not because they didn't believe that it had happened, but because they were unsure of what events started and if there were any mitigating circumstances 
um, that took place prior to the cat being killed. Um, and since no one witnessed the onset of the attack and had only actually heard the altercation going on and responded out to it, they weren't able to fill that in. Um, and there were other pieces like, you know, um, the witness, the witness had a medical emergency for commission. Technically, we could have in practice things like, well, if the witness isn't able to come, then we can recommend postponing, but that will slow the process um, for the animals to get hurt. And one of animal care and control's priorities um, has and continues to be, we want to move the animals through the process as quickly as we can. Um, because it doesn't do anyone any good, not the animals, not the owners, not animal care and control, not the community, to house animals here at our shelter long term, even when we're doing our very best to care for them. Um, it's just not, not an ideal situation. I'm not sure, Robin, how you would do that, because the circuit court by nature takes a long time. I mean, we can't get cases involving children moved through the system any quicker, so I'm not sure that how we'd be able to jump animals um, it ha you know, I don't believe there's an expedited appeals process. I believe you could yeah. at least within the county's jurisdiction. For example, right now, after the chief's decision, um, the owner has 30 days to appeal. When the initial order is issued, we give 10 days to appeal. We can, we can speed that process. Then on top of that, right now, when you all hear a case, the law says that you're supposed to hear it within 30 days of the appeal, of course, unless there's postponements and things like that. Right now, there's nothing about that for Board of Appeals. So for that case, when it went to Board of Appeals, I wanna say it went, you all heard it in April and it was several months before it got before Board of Appeals. And then Board of Appeals has 60 days to make their recommendation. If they can't make their recommendation within 60 days, and we have this actually going on with another case that you all heard, the Burke case. You guys heard that many, many months ago. Um, that was a case where the owners were trying to get the animals back, not a public safety case, but a case where the animals were subject to neglect. And um, the Board of Appeals sent us all a letter that said they needed more time. They, they had already had their 60 days. Now they've sent us a letter that says they need more time than that. Um, so the process, even before circuit court, if we can speed it anywhere, we can speed it everywhere. Um, because if we can make the process faster for the animals, um, that helps expedite those decisions and also helps make things less expensive for the owners who, if ultimately are required to pay the $5 a day, would save them money because we're moving the process a lot faster. So I see plenty of ways in the current code. I'm with you. We're all used to court, but there are other areas and I'm just, where it yeah, can be amended. The, I mean, you're talking about amending several sections of the code, especially if you're going to restrict the Board of Appeals times. But I mean, for today's I mean, and I guess as a commission, we could make that recommendation, but um, for today's purposes, I don't, we're not going to be able to address all that. I do want to say, um, just full disclosure here, um, in case some enterprising person does an address check, um, if you may or may not know, the attorneys that handled the um, Lucy and Odin case actually work out of um, my office. I had no idea that they filed this case. We don't discuss cases and I don't even work in the office anymore. I've worked from home for the last five years or so. Um, I only go in there when I need to meet clients. So I just wanted to let you guys know that um, because we do still share an address, but I had no idea and actually until I saw it in the papers <laughs> um, that they had worked on this. Um, That's interesting. I appreciate the full disclosure there, Jennifer, but it yeah, um, I, I, I nothing to do with and, it. We get lawyer <laughs> share offices, so... <laughs> Um, yeah, so I just wanted to put that out there. Dr. Hammer's been patiently waiting. Well, it's, um, thank you. Uh, listening to everything, and I, I read this several times over the weekend, and I guess I kind of go back a little bit to when I was on the commission previously several years ago. One of the things that just always motiv motivated me in terms of trying to wrestle through any of these decisions was the whole reason why we exist and the whole reason why we exist is to uh you know protect and promote public safety with animals and and i think everyone agrees and everybody knows that and one of the problems i have with this is that we are just a a cog in a huge justice wheel and we're probably the first cog people ever really encounter uh when it comes to dealing with pet disturbances um from a quasi-legal perspective 
And it's always bothered me whenever we get statutes and laws created that, that begin to hamper what our flexibility is in terms of what options we can offer to trying to deal with public safety. Something like this um, is just gonna completely hamper what the commission can do and is gonna really put us in a position where you know, we just don't have any, we just don't have any options. And more importantly, we just don't have any good options in terms of trying to protect public safety. Um, I recognize that, 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 that we are not the final say in what happens to these animals. It certainly goes up to the chief of police. And that's where the next step of the cog of the justice wheel kicks in. But I think at our level, we need to have as broad a net as we can to capture data and evidence so that we can make a determination as to what we feel is is in the public interest of safety dealing with an animal going forward anything that restricts that anything that restricts that is is going to basically be a hindrance and certainly is going to ultimately negatively impact public safety and ultimately that's why we're all here that's exactly why we're all here Thank you. Well said. Yeah, I agree. And actually, I, it kind of leads me to one little last question I think I have. I was, uh, and someone who followed the case can answer. Our our decision, was it brought up in court when it came down in that, that, that the Animal Matters Commission reduced this? And Robin, can you let me know? I just, I didn't follow this close enough, obviously. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so certainly the recommendation of the Animal uh, Matters Commission was brought up in various steps of the process. Um, just so you all know, the ultimate order that ended up being placed was not as restrictive as you all had recommended. Um, you know, so the, the chief's uh, order ultimately was the vicious. You all had recommended a strict dangerous. The dogs ended up with dangerous orders, but with a type of fencing that um, was not a stockade fence. And there were other, um, let's call them um, ways, ways that things were adjusted to make it as easy for the owners to comply as possible to get the animals back. And hopefully at the same time, protect public safety. But that just that was not made as a matter of ruling, correct? I mean, that was a negotiated settlement, and that correct. was after the county executive weighed in on this, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes, the judge well, did I'm not make an order. They, the judge, she remanded it back to Court of Appeals so that they would review whether or not there were mitigating circumstances, and also with the hope that the eyewitness would um, be able to come forward for that. And in fact, just after that, um, the eyewitness came into animal care and control, rewrote another statement and said, if I'm needed at Board of Appeals, I will be able to be there. But the witness had moved um, during the case and animal care and control had not had an, a current address for him. Yeah, I guess uh, what, what when I'm looking at all this, uh, getting back to my point previously of having as much flexibility as possible is that we can't impact what the next levels of appeal are. We can't impact what the chief of police decision is. And that's all the more reason why we need to have as much latitude, as much flexibility as we can um, to protect the public safety. Because once we make a decision, it's out of our hands in terms of how the lawyers are gonna negotiate things, what the chief of police is gonna do, what the board of appeals, or, or, or even the district court or the court of appeals is gonna do. But, but, but if we don't have that ability to have a wide cast on evidence brought before us, it's gonna really hamper, as I said earlier, what we're gonna be able to do and what we're gonna be able to recommend going forward. I agree. Agreed. I'd also like to point out that for a lot of these folks, okay, the, the Lucy and Odin case, um, I don't want to say it's an anomaly, but it's it's rare that someone go, spends the kind of money that those owners did. Um, you know, I mean, they were almost $30,000 deep to make that happen. Litigation like that is not cheap. So for the majority of the general public, it, it stops with us and whatever the chief of police um, recommends. You know, most of these cases are not appealed. But um, in regards to Dr. Hemmer's uh, statements, I would like to add that I, I think, and maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but I mean, we're charged with public safety. And I think that is one of our primary 
concerns, but we're also charged with protecting animals because, you know, we hear a lot of um, neglect cases and it's our job to also um, look out for the welfare of the animals as well. So um, I don't think, it, it sounds to me from like what I'm hearing that we're all in agreement that dictating evidence this way um, is, we, we, we cannot support this in the legislation. Um, there's no other place in the statute that we do it. We don't do it for humans. Why would we do it for animals? Um, but having said that, however, I, I'd like to get a clearer read on everyone's feel on the burden of proof because um, I'm okay with <clears throat> shifting that um, to an extent. I think the law is a balancing act um, in general. You know, you always have to balance the due process. Um, you know, the, the, the public interest against the rights of the accused. And I have a problem with sentencing an animal to death based on an affidavit. Um, so for me, I definitely want more and I want a higher standard of, you know, I'm okay with a higher standard of evidence. I don't know if it needs to be the beyond a reasonable doubt, but I'm certainly happy with um, clear and convincing. Um, you know, if that requires um, some uncomfortable eyewitness testimony, I think that's unfortunate. And I certainly wouldn't want to have been the one to have that, um, that sweet 11 year old girl have to testify. But in regular criminal cases, that happens all the time. If that's the witness to a vicious attack or crime, then, then that's, um, you know, that may be what you need. I don't know. Um, I don't think you can script it in a statute the way they have. Um, I think that's kind of for us to decide if we need to, if we need to have more, but um, I'm in favor of increasing the burden of proof for the dangerous and vicious orders, even though I object to the other statements uh, designating, dictating the evidence. And I, Robin immediately raised her hand, so I'm sure she's, um, I just wanna point out though, before Robin speaks, that one of the things that bothers me and Robin, I mean no disrespect, um, that facts of one case were used to influence another. The facts of that ring video case were used to, to determine how, you know, how the chief of police ruled on that, that case that, you know, where we had decided to reduce it, he chose not to because a subsequent case changed his mind. We have rules in place specifically to avoid that. I mean, if you're on trial for something, what somebody else did next door shouldn't impact the facts of your case. Um, so I, I kind of find that a little um, disturbing. If we need to stay, change the statute, so be it. But I don't like applying what went on in, in one case and using that to be dispositive in another. So I'll, I'll start with addressing that if you want. That didn't address the facts of the case. What that addressed and, and how that is used for us is that a lot of people, thankfully, are shielded from the things that animal care and control sees as part of our day-to-day -day things. A lot of cases don't go before the Animal Matters Commission, et cetera, and we see horrific things. And so when we make our determination as to which order, we are required by law to take into consideration the totality of things. And that does include how this could have impacted other people and how it would in the future. So that is how it was used, not as a matter of evidence in the case, but as a matter of consideration for how we best protect public safety and what is in the public's best interest. Um, so it's important um, for me that I make that very clear and I apologize if I hadn't done that before. Um, I certainly welcome um, constructive criticism, Jennifer. That's something that, that we're all here for is looking for the best outcome for everyone involved. So. Um, please don't 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 worry about that. Um, and then I had raised my hand um, for a couple of things, and then I totally lost my train of thought. But one thing that I wanted to comment on is is it is very rare. So I looked back um, in this process after seeing this. Um, actually, I'd already been looking back um, based on the Lucy and Odin case prior to any draft of legislation being introduced um, for several years. Um, back to 2019 for all of the cases that the commission heard in regards to administrative orders. I didn't worry about citations or anything like that, um, but administrative orders um, to review those and see where you all's recommendation fell. Um, it, if it was a time when my recommendation was um, requested via chain of command where mine fell um, and what the ultimate decision of the chief was. And it's very clear in reviewing them that the majority of the time, we agree. Um, the majority of the time, your recommendation is, is followed. It is 
very rare, um, less, less than a full hand of times um, that those things were changed. And then um, there are quite a few every year that get appealed to Board of Appeals. Um, certainly there are fewer that get appealed to circuit court, but Board of Appeals is something um, that animal care and control and often a member of the Office of Law has to, has to go and represent us there. Um, that happens pretty frequently um, that, that people appeal to that next level. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you all were aware of that. Um, because a lot of times I think you guys don't get to hear what happens next after, after they leave you all. Um, and I know sometimes that, that follow-up, um, you know, had, has been necessary. I also made note, and I'd be happy to share this spreadsheet with you all if you want, um, made notes of things like what histories were for, um, you know, for example, the most recent case that you heard that was a vicious order was on, um, Henny, who had had a prior warning letter, then prior dangerous order and then was involved in another bite and you all recommended upholding um, vicious. There were several cases in that three year history where we saw animals that um, repeated um, and um, violated orders and things like that. Hey Robin, if I may interrupt you real quick, of the vicious orders that the commission prescribed since like 1919 or whatever you were doing your data review, how many of those vicious orders ended up in euthanasia? Do you know that offhand? Um, it was a reasonably small number, but I can look and have it for you in just a minute. Thank you, Robin. So just because an animal gets a vicious um, labeling does not mean that it's automatically euthanized, correct? Correct. Correct. They still have the process, and, and there were others that you all had recommended downgrading that had um, been downgraded and there were some that had not and you only want me to look at vicious right I'm, yeah you're I'm only vicious i'm confused so you mean if but if by what you just said if if a, if a dog is deemed vicious and that order stays in place the dog is euthanized correct yeah that is correct but at the, the end of the but there are process. avenues yeah there are avenues for us to reduce and things like that so no, no i understand that but dr hemmer's question was how often does a vicious order end in euthanasia and the answer confused me because there is no other option if the vicious right. order is the end of the road that is the result what you're talking about though is is if people are able to overturn that vicious order later i huh? I, I guess what i'm asking i guess what i'm asking jennifer is if we decide an animal is vicious through our hearings then what is the end result at the very end when when, right. when the um uh, when the uh, owner has exhausted all appeals processes, how many of those animals wind up getting euthanized? And I guess what I'm asking a roundabout way is, for all the vicious orders that we put out there, how many wind up staying vicious orders by the time they completely go through the appeals process, assuming that all vicious animals, once they get that designation, are in fact euthanized? Does that make sense? What yeah, I, what so you're I talking about, so when animal control initially issues a vicious order, it, even starting with our process, or you're talking about the difference between when they initially, you know, we're seeing it for the first time, they've issued the order, they sit in front of us, we decide it we're is gonna vicious. reduce. But, well, let's say we decide we're going to reduce, then that would then count as a vicious order. In your mind, is that a vicious order that was then not put, to, not Vacated. actually. Correct. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. An animal All the way through the process. Nice. All the way through the process, yeah. Because what I'm trying to get a handle on is how many of these animals that cross our desk every month are actually being euthanized. I mean, is it a significant number? Is it, you know, hardly any? Um, I just, you know, since again, we're talking off, of, you know, I believe as, you know, I've been on this commission as long as anybody that's sitting here, I believe. I mean, I, Dr. Hammer, you've been, you, you served before me. I joined mm -hmm. the commission, you know, in your tenure. Um, when this order came about, I, I will say that for the, for the most part, as a commission, I believe that we've all tried and we will all try every which way to make sure if there's a, if there's a chance for an animal to survive, that we'll give the person that chance. If it's a situation where we, where it was an obvious situation where we can make a, a physical change to the property or whatever it is, we always go out of our way to do mm -hmm. that. If it's 
blatantly obvious based on a person's attitude towards the situation that no matter what we tell these people to do, it's not going to get done. Just like, you know, Miss Porto described, you know, with these, other, yeah. there's always that situation. And, and in those situations, it's like, you want to give the animal a chance but it, it, when it comes to all these orders, you know, people always say, we don't want my dog to be dangerous. And it's like, I wish we could call this the, the stupid human orders, but we can't, Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, that's really what most of these come down to. And, and yep. really, Agreed. You know, we had a situation years ago where a veteran came in and, and he walked in the door and he sat down in front of us and he said, this isn't a dog, this is a weapon. And it's like, okay, if you're going to take that attitude in front of us, obviously we know where you stand here. You know, we know what's going on here. And he had other things going on mentally, I believe. But bottom line is that's where I think, you know, having the leeway within, you know, based on, you know, the evidence and everything, to me, it's having the leeway in this commission, hearing this stuff year, you know, week in, week out for years, understanding kind of like, you know, we could do things that could affect it, but not having that tool is the worst, I think. So. I agree, Tom. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly in your comment that a lot of times we deal with the general public that owns dogs, particularly dogs that are um, have have behavioral issues. They just don't seem to care, and a lot of times it's it's people not making the best decisions or the best choices for their pets that wind up. That's why the reason why they wind up in front of us. And if we have any kind of curtailing of our ability to hear evidence, it's really going to hamstring, as I said earlier, what we're going to be able to do and how best we're going to be able to protect the public. And when we're talking about these orders, we always look at the animal as an individual, and we also look at the owner as an individual. And like I keep saying, any restriction of how we can take evidence in is going to just really not lead to good outcomes all the way around. And 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 that's my position. Uh, I learned by by observing um, the prior uh, uh, chairmen, that uh, especially Tom, uh, when we do get a dangerous or a potentially dangerous order where there's a list of of uh, conditions um, and they have appealed, uh, one of the first questions uh, that were are asked is uh, uh, which one of these do you have an, a problem with? And it's uh, it, it's kind of like renegotiating the thing well we have a problem with this or have a problem with that and you know, some of them gets modified some of them get stricken and um you know i think that that part of the system is working i think i i think as it is for us as a commission also uh noting that we as a commission did not let down the odin and lucy case we as a commission did not i'm repeating it we as a commission did not let down the Odin and, and, and Lucy case. Uh, we did what we usually do. So, um, Robin, do you have those numbers? Yes. So, um, looking back, um, so tw- to 2018, we there were 40 vicious orders done. And a reminder, that's less than 1% of the cases that we investigate. And of those, 27 dogs ended up being euthanized. Okay. Um, in 2021, there was one dog euthanized for being vicious. Wow. How many of those were not appealed at all? Just went straight to, you know, you issued the order and they went straight to euthanasia. That's going to take me more time, but I can work on getting you that. I mean, it's interesting. It, it's an interesting. And I, I suspect number. that it's not, I mean, I guess I could be wrong. I suspect it's a low number. I mean, most people, a lot of folks don't take an attorney to the Board of Appeals. Um, but you know, to get an attorney to take on a case up in circuit court to overturn the board of appeals, that's, that's high dollar. And most folks can't afford that. Like I said, I, you know, it, it seems to me without having any statistics in front of me that what went on in the Lucy and Odin case, um, was the exception that that does not. Um, Definitely the exception. But I think Tom was asking how many get appealed because there, you guys do not see all of the orders that we do, be they potentially dangerous, dangerous, or vicious. You only see those at your level. And majority of folks do not have an attorney at the Animal Matters Commission level. Um, and we do have a lot of owners that take an order and, and comply. Um, you know, some, some, people, some people we don't even get to vicious. We have cases where we're investigating it and an owner contacts us immediately and says they want to have the animal euthanized because they've come to that decision on their own. Um, okay.
Well, I think getting back to where Jennifer was on this, can we um, maybe take a straw poll of the commission members and kind of get a feel for where everybody at is with where everybody is with this? Very good. That I think that is I, the purpose of this discussion. Um, hopefully, it will be reviewed by uh, um, the uh, people that Miss. Uh, Dr. Cod uh, Bogus de Bruin um, wants us to uh, give the input. Hopefully, this will be reviewed by them. Um, yeah, I, I and and I'll say this. I think it's it's my opinion that I believe that the dangerous and potentially dangerous are are working as far as the commission and the system goes. I do agree that perhaps some tightening of the uh, evidence language for vicious may be uh, necessary, but as proposed in this legislation, um, even that uh, would be too restrictive because uh, if you, like I said, if, if you need the digital evidence and a witness, chances are you're not gonna have them even to go uh, make a complaint with. Uh, you, you, vicious, like I said, it, we saw an example of that uh, here in our discussion. Um, if that ring camera wasn't on, uh, there would have been no evidence at all. And a lot of people don't have those rings yet. It's not uh, it's not required. So, um, has anybody uh, objected to taking a little straw poll with us? Uh, right now to see if um, uh, if we are in favor or we are opposed of the uh, proposed uh, language to the uh, to the to the law to be introduced. Uh, I think uh, I guess maybe we should pose the question as uh, I think we should all, pose it based on the statute, Ed. I'm sorry, I don't mean to. Yeah, as we. Do we want to read it into the into the record uh, as it is, or is everybody comfortable with the copies they have and they understand the copies? I think I, Phil, I, uh, I, I understand the draft legislation that was sent to us. If you want to read the whole thing, it's fine. But I I I'm, I understand what we're talking about here. Yeah, I, I think understand Philip, as well. Philip Philip explained it uh, very well that the uh, bracketed items, I believe, were to be deleted. Uh, the items in capital letters were to be uh, imposed or included. <laughs> so given that, um, I guess uh, I'll ask all in. Go ahead, Robin. I'm sorry. Sorry, just want to I'm trying to get you the information you guys are asking for. So you have it when making all your stuff. So in 2019 to um, Two seven of 2022, um, you all heard 10 appeals of vicious orders. And of those six dogs were ultimately euthanized. Um, and it is important to note that of those, one, two, three of them had prior orders prior to having a vicious order. Okay, now uh, I have a question. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question Absolutely. that uh, um, is it just the commission that's going to do the straw poll, or would Robin and Phil and everybody uh, be allowed to uh, offer their opinion? I appreciate the vote of confidence, sir, but uh, our opinion was not asked. Okay. Okay. Uh, Philip, can I clarify, because I asked this in the email, but I don't think I ever got a clear answer. Are we tasked as a, com um, as a commission as a whole that we have to come to an agreement to set forth a position? Or no. are we being asked for our individual opinions? Either or. Yeah, it's really just input. Um, okay. There's no, this isn't formal by any stretch. It was just they were looking for, for your thoughts as commissioners 
Uh, I don't think you guys have to like vote on a decision. We support this or not. It's just they're they're polling for information so they can educate themselves to move forward. Because you guys, like you said, you're the the first line in this process. So it's just good advice from you guys. And and please, and please also feel free. Uh, it, it doesn't have to end here with the Zoom meeting. Please, uh, Commission, if you feel uh, so moved, um, send a letter, uh, call your uh, county councilman, um, what have you, your, even the county executive. Um, I would suggest uh, notifying them on your feelings because you, you have the experience in dealing with this and I think that should be taken very, very seriously, uh, your opinions, because we've had the experience of uh, most of us several years in, in hearing these cases, applying the, the rules and regulations. And um, for the most part, um, and I have said, I, I believe it's working as is. I, I do uh, feel myself that uh, perhaps some language, not the language that's proposed, but some language to strengthen the vicious orders may be, uh, may be needed, but uh, turn everything on here, I can't agree with it. So um, I will take a straw poll among us, all in favor of the proposed language, raise your hand. Well, I, I, that was my question. Can we break this down? Because you're doing it as a whole as it as is the language as proposed is i think that's all we can do okay as a so we're taking this as a yeah, whole it's either all or nothing not as amended with our problems i mean our, our input uh, as as is all in favor raise your hand okay as is all opposed to the proposed uh language raise your hand Okay, that's it. Uh, do we need any further discussion on the matter? Yeah, I mean, I think was, I think it would be appropriate to go by, you know, to go down just to give them our input on each specific sure. so it, for potentially dangerous, for dangerous, for vicious, and, and just go down by the change, what changes, and maybe each change just say, you know, I, I could do it as a whole for me, and then you guys can go down the line and say this is what I propose, or if you want to say, you know, propose, you know, what the change would be. I don't know. It would be kind of confusing to do on Zoom, but. I do yeah, think I agree. I'm I not going to mention the, the additions that I added in my letter. You all read that for yourselves if you want. But yes, that's a good idea, Tom. All right. So, I mean, I'll start if you like. I mean, I make, make this easy. Yes. So, if Dr. Kai Bogus or whoever is looking at this or is listening to this right now, um, basically looking at this, you know, I, I'm looking at this over, you know, all the discussion we've had. And I, I kind of agree with Dr. Hemmer. I think that potentially dangerous, dangerous orders, I kind of think that they should stay evidentiary the same way. I don't see any changes to those being necessary at all. Um, I don't believe that- um, When you say stay the same way, as written in the statute or as they are now? As they are now, not as written in the statute, as, as they are now. I, I'd be fine with leaving them as they are now. And I would be somewhat, you know, I could be convinced that for, um, you know, there is some merit maybe to increasing the evidentiary you know, maybe not all the way to determine the by reasonable doubt uh, for vicious, but I do believe that maybe you know there, you know, there could be an argument made that increasing that for you know especially when when it comes to the fact that if there's no other options given to us other than euthanasia, you know there should be a higher, I think at least a slightly higher evidentiary um, you know determination need to be made if if we're going to put somebody's animal down, um, and then I obviously do not agree at all with the um, with you know, being able to you know, only be able to provide digital and or eyewitness testimony. I believe that there's there's been plenty of discussion of that here. So that's kind of how myself as representing the health department is has looked at this and come to that decision. Um, and I, if I could make a recommendation. Sure, Phil. So we could start at the beginning of the changes, list each one, hear each commissioner's input on that specific right, that's it. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Through the, the proposal. Does that sound? You can do yes. that too. That's fine. Absolutely. So the first main change that I see, we have the amendment to the potentially dangerous. It is adding the requirement by clear and convincing evidence right, for potentially cool. dangerous order. Yeah. 
So then for me, I would say that I, I would disagree with that. I would keep it as as statute stands now. I agree with Tom. I agree with Tom. I do too. Keep it as it. Um gosh, I, I, I could go either way. Um but I am I will defer to the majority of my commission members on that. I'm not opposed to the clear and convincing, but I can go along with leaving it preponderance of the evidence. And this is mostly um, just gathering opinion. We're not we're not voting on it, so that's all okay. So then the second change to the dangerous order, adding by clear and convincing evidence. And I again, I believe that as the statute stands, I, I'm okay with that as the statute stands now. I agree with Tom. And I also do. Do I? If my statements stay the same, I can. <laughs> <laughs> So the next change, we have the vicious order, bringing that to and determined by uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, and again, I, I believe that maybe some changes is necessary there. I, I, I could go either way, whether it should stay the same, maybe increase, but I don't believe that by a reasonable doubt is, is, is the level it needs to be at. I think it should be less than that. Yeah, I'd be comfortable with uh, clear and convincing evidence for the vicious one. I agree with Tom. I, I I agree with that. And um, uh, where does the digital evidence and all that come in? Uh, we well, haven't gotten there yet. Okay. And 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 I I agree. I agree. All right. And then yep, the next section requiring either testimony from an eyewitness <clears throat> to the events or authenticated digital evidence. Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't believe that should be added. I think that um, not unless there's other factors that are added as well to it that spells it out specifically and gives other other instances like we've given up, you know, opportunities today. So either it stays with added things to it that, that gives more range for people or it's just removed altogether. Yeah, I go with removed altogether because once you've set the standard, um, like if you make the standard clear and convincing, anything that gets you to that point, um, it should be enough. And if we started listing out every probability we're going to miss more than we could possibly think of and i think you run into dangerous territory all right that's fair enough okay i agree, I agree with jennifer yeah. yeah i'd say remove altogether i agree that, that i agree with that that's fine we we'll really tie our hands on that that robin i know i don't normally participate this much in a commission no, 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 no. i want to make right, sure yeah. that you i that we as animal care and control are providing as much information as possible and one thing um that i heard come up with you all quite a few times in listening to the recommendations at commission and in Ed's letter and in discussion today and something that has also come up for animal care and control. Um, when we've had cases where we felt like the animals in and of themselves in the hands of responsible people do not pose a threat, um, but we do not feel like the owner meets that description. Um, our hands have been kind of tied, and, and I'm sure those of you that have been on, on the commission for a while recall the legislation that we tried to do to address that, which is irresponsible ownership um, legislation that unfortunately COVID made extra difficult um, for us, so we haven't been able to use that um, much because it required um, multiple guilties at the court level. And as Jennifer mentioned earlier, getting anything even to court um, at this point can be incredibly difficult. Um, is that right now, and I did ask uh, the Office of Law this before, um, I said, well, would there be a way for us to amend the legislation to allow for animal care and control or commission, something like that, to recommend um, labeling the owners irresponsible at an earlier point in time and rehoming the animals. Um, and Lauren, I'm, I'm sorry, you're kind of trial by fire here because you probably don't have the background on these things. Um, but when I did ask that right now, we can't do that because essentially we have to meet that certain level of burden for irresponsible owner. Um, and I was asked at, at other cases, if we, if we label them vicious, then can animal care and control place them? And the law is no. Right now, if it's labeled dangerous, animal care and control cannot find another placement based on the, the county code. So as you all are thinking of things, 
you could make a recommendation to amend that law to allow animal care and control the ability to find appropriate placement for an animal that has been deemed dangerous. Because often what we're talking about in these cases, similar to the Lucian Oden case that was discussed today, you all had recommended downgrading to dangerous. And as I mentioned before, based on the feedback from the owner, we did not feel that the owner would be able to um, meet the order and protect the public. And you all, at least my recollection of, in even rewatching the video several times, felt like your options were either hold them vicious and give the dogs no chance or label them dangerous and, and hope for the best. Um, and so another option could be that the law be amended to allow appropriate placement of an animal that has been deemed dangerous at the recommendation of the commission or something along those lines. Just wanted to throw that out there for you all. Dangerous or vicious or both? Um, right now, we can do it for potentially dangerous. We can't do it for dangerous. The way the law is written, you couldn't do it for vicious. But if, if it was downgraded to dangerous, you could. Gotcha. Okay. Robin, how does liability shift in that? What happens um, so if, that if, if, if we downgrade it and then I've got animal control homing out potentially vicious animals and there's an incident? Uh, is there any liability blowback on animal control, the county, or quite frankly, the commission itself? Um, well, you guys at this point just give a recommendation, and I'm not a lawyer, so Lauren might be better to, to weigh in, but but you're not the ultimate decider. It would be the chief um, that okay. would be the ultimate decider, so I wouldn't anticipate there being any liability for you all as a commission. Um, I think that's probably one of the reasons you're advisory as opposed to making uh, that call. Um, okay. Generally speaking, and again, Lauren could correct me if I'm wrong, what we have to do is we have to full disclosure, be transparent about everything um, with any animal. And generally speaking, the government is only held liable, in my understanding, if there's gross negligence. So if something was deemed okay. dangerous and we had not properly informed um, or tried to put the protections in place, then we could might be, be able to be considered grossly negligent. But if we had been transparent about all the information, which is our policy for any animal, um, that we have information about its behavior, background, history, that kind of stuff, that that's where the issue could come in. Um, of course, you know, whether or not the county would be willing to accept that liability, whether or not we'd be able to find another placement, those are all different issues. But right now we don't have the legal ability to even try. I understand. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, with, with anything, um, we need to evolve um, and, and agree that things need to evolve. Um, the uh, publicity and uh, issues surrounding the Odin and Lucy case um, presented some issues. And this is what um, this is this is what the county uh, council is going to try to fix. And that's why this language was. Uh, proposed. So anybody have anything else? Hearing none, um, I will, uh, I will move to, uh, I have reviewed the minutes of the last uh, meeting and they are accurate. Um, I did, and uh, I will need a motion to accept the minutes as reflected. Move to uh, accept the minutes. Okay, Thank all you. in favor? Okay, motion carries. Are there any other issues to be discussed today? I think we just clarify the discussion that was had regarding the um, proposed unnumbered bill. Uh, it sounded like the general consensus was that the potentially dangerous uh, amendment by clear and convincing evidence should be stricken. The dangerous amendment uh, adding by clear and convincing evidence should be stricken. The vicious, it, it kind of sounded like a couple people were suggesting that rather than beyond reasonable doubt, it be clear and convincing, which is up from the current preponderance and uh, that the eyewitness or digital requirement should be stricken. That's correct. Right. I believe that's correct. Yep. Making sure 
so that way I can write that all down. And thank you. Well, I'd just like to say before we dismiss, it's nice to see a, an almost full commission here. I'd like, to welcome Dr. Hammer back. I, I, I definitely is good to have a, a veterinarian on the staff and. I know that he, as I started with the commission, how many years ago, you know, the, I kind of, you know, took, you know, I, I definitely looked at him as a, a really good proponent for, for animals and, and everything. And he's been, I've worked with him actually otherwise uh, through some cases that have come up through the health department. So um, welcome back. And uh, thank you, Tom. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just had something come up and this puts me in a really awkward position. I'm not sure if I should mention this or not, but I want the commission to be aware. Um, I literally just got a text from my law office that the complainant in this morning's case um, called the office wanting to speak to me. Um, and <laughs> so I'm letting you all know, um, I'm not going to talk to her, obviously. Um, the case is still pending appeal. I just want to put it out there and make everyone aware since um, I have no idea where it will um, go from here. But um, wonderful. Hmm. Yeah, that was that was interesting. <laughs> Happy Monday. <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say thank you all for your feedback and, and for helping with all of these cases. I know that this is a volunteer thing for most of you and your time and your your thoughts are all very much appreciated and help us trying to resolve things for the community as best we can. Well, I tell you, you welcome. This is uh, a great, a great staff uh, and a great commission. Um, a lot of good, a lot of good brains on here. So, uh, and a lot of caring people, and that's 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 exactly what we need. Um, and uh, I, I I hope to go forward with that. Uh, like I said, I I think we're working. I think we're working very well together. I think we're making a lot of good accomplishments um, for the future. Um, so with that. I guess uh, we can conclude our business for the day. Uh, Jennifer, I'm glad you, you, you stated that because um, I, I will uh, put this out there from time to time. Um, people do approach us. I know I've been approached to assist in any way I can with an individual case, and you can't do that. It's a conflict of interest. That's what I tell uh, the person, the individual, uh, and I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, you can be, uh, it, it's like a sports, a sporting event. You know, I, I liken it to that. You know, when, when my kids play little league, one team or the other is going to walk away disappointed. And that's the way it is. You can't go back and, and change a call here or there to make somebody win or lose. So, with that, do I have um, a... Uh, also, though, just for you commissioners that may not know, something like that then goes outside of the scope of your commission and you are not no longer afforded the protections that you are as a commission. There was a question earlier about liability. Right. Um, and, you know, if we are doing this in the due course with proper consideration and everything, we are generally protected um, as, um, you know, a administrative body. But if you start having conversations with complainants and witnesses outside of this, you lose some of that protection and you could expose yourself to liability. So, which is why, one of the reasons why I felt compelled to let y'all know that um, this morning's complaint and wasted no time contacting me privately. Um, and I, I obviously will not speak to her. And just so everyone knows, um, obviously I see animals every day that every month I ask uh, Phil for uh, the agenda so I can run a conflict of interest uh, through my database here. I look for clients and pets and I plan on recusing myself if I've had any professional interactions with them going forward, but just so everybody knows that I, I am aware of that and I try and stay on top of that to avoid any uh, any guise of impropriety and try and stay as transparent as possible. That's very good. That, that is the uh, another thing. Um, I, I think I was on the uh, commission when uh, Larry uh, was the, uh, chairman and there was a case involving his neighbor and they were friends and he reclused himself uh, from that hearing. So uh, that would be what would be expected. That's the kind of thing that we expect uh, if there would be a possible uh, 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 conflict of interest uh, going on. So 
with I'll that, just let you guys know next month, I'm not going to be in. Greg is going to fill in for me. I'm going to be at a conference out of state trying to upgrade our oral rabies vaccination program stuff, trying to learn some new stuff. So um, Greg will fill in. If something crazy happens with that, Phil, I'll reach out to you and let you know. But he should be the one attending. Thank you, sir. Yep. Thank you. Good. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Seconded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day. See you next month. Bye bye. Bye.